listening to Radio Sputnik. 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 Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Some men hate a crab because it runs sideways, not straight, and disturbs the sand thirstily. They chase it madly across the beach with sticks. If you've ever seen a more revolting spectacle than the reptilian hypocrites of the great British mass media breathing hot air into each other's faces, ears and eyes as they mass together as a lump of hypocrites. So they can bring us another picture of a man opening his car boot and putting a bicycle into it. Then I don't know what that spectacle could possibly be. I hate it just as much as I hated it when they used to do it to Jeremy Corbyn. How about you, single standards, double standards, anyone? Now I regard Dominic Cummings as a right-wing runt, runt, I said, uh, with a taste for eugenics. So he ain't no friend of mine. But if you think it's revolution to get an advisor sacked from his job, if you think that's going to put any potatoes on your plate or make this government any less ugly, I've got news for you. I don't want Dominic Cummings sacked because I don't think it will make any difference at all, except maybe make this government worse. I want to see this entire government on trial for corporate manslaughter as a result of the tens of thousands of lives that they have cost us in those missing 22 days. It's the mother of all talk shows. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. This is Radio Sputnik. And this is London, but coming to you, of course, all over the world, thanks to the wonders of the internet. And of course, SputnikNews.com, without whom none of this would be happening. We are on FM in the Washington DC area, 105.5 are the magic numbers there, in crystal clarity in the capital of the United States, but also on AM radio across the United States from sea to shining sea. And on the internet, of course, as I said, all over the world, on sputniknews.com. But half a million of you, again, last week, watched the mother of all talk shows as well as listened to it. And most of them did so on Facebook, either on my own page, George Galloway Official, Blue Tick. And if that's what you're doing, please share it now, right now, with all of your friends and contacts. Or you can watch on Facebook on the various RT platforms there. Ditto on YouTube. Again, George Galloway Official, and do subscribe if that's where you're now at or going to, uh, or on RT's multiple YouTube channels. You can watch also on Twitter and even on Instagram. But however you're watching or listening, you better fasten your seatbelts uh, because there's going to be some home truths. There are few sights uglier in my experience uh, than a pack of reptiles, uh, especially in an era of social distancing, literally climbing on top of each other. A goat, you know what, standing on top of each other to take pictures of each other, taking pictures of their quarry. A quarry who is supremely uninteresting to most people. Most people had never heard of him until this because, hey, Twitter isn't Britain and social media is not the world. But all he's doing is actually putting a bicycle 
into the boot of his car. But his wife and his small child, a toddler, are terrified indoors at the incredible scrum of scum outside. Now, I'm not a hypocrite, you see. I used to say that every single day when Norman Smith and the rest of the reptiles were camped outside the door of Jeremy Corbyn, just so we could get yet another picture of Jeremy Corbyn coming out of his front door, closing it, and walking past them into a taxi. It is a gross waste of journalistic effort, especially when there's so much else to report. That which they extraordinarily uh, consistently fail to report. There was no press pack at the Elephant and Castle food bank yesterday in the heart of London when hundreds upon hundreds of people were queuing for free food because they had no money to buy food for themselves. There is no press pack outside our care homes where our government has killed, and I say that word advisedly, has killed thousands of old age pensioners. And they didn't die, they were killed. And anyone who reads, I wouldn't normally recommend it, uh, the Sunday Times report today can be in no doubt whatsoever that our British government is willfully responsible for the deaths of thousands of our people during the 22 days when they did absolutely nothing at all, even though they knew this scourge of the coronavirus was coming our way. Now, did Dominic Cummings break the lockdown? I don't know, uh, to be perfectly frank. Arguably not on the first occasion. If there was a second occasion, let alone a third, then undoubtedly he did. But then a third of our people have broken the lockdown. One third. That's uh, roughly 22 million British people have broken the lockdown. I myself have not. No one has more scrupulously observed the terms of the lockdown than me. And that's why I feel in a solid position to comment on this whole affair. But then there isn't a lockdown. There's no meaningful lockdown. And there has been no meaningful lockdown. Live on air, just a couple of weeks ago, I brought you the breaking news. In fact, it was the last time that Boris Johnson spoke to the nation when he told us that we had to go back to work. What kind of lockdown tells the mass of millions of British workers that they must go back to work? That's not a lockdown. When they told us, backed by Sir Keir Starmer, where is he, by the way? That our children had to go back to school on June the 1st, next week, when we have absolutely no idea whether there's a spike in coronavirus cases coming down the pipe as a result of the virtual abolition of the lockdown announced a couple of weeks ago by Boris Johnson. But then there was no lockdown right from the start. A lockdown is what you had in China, in Wuhan, where nobody is out, where everybody is in, and where the streets are being disinfected, where aeroplanes are not allowed to take off, buses not allowed to run, trains stopped, not allowed to go anywhere, the people not allowed to leave Wuhan, and the rest of China not allowed to enter. That's a lockdown. That's what you call a lockdown. And it was astoundingly successful, both because the Chinese government has the organizational capability and the nous 
and I'd argue the commitment to the public health of their people uh, to carry it off, none of which our government was remotely in possession of. A lockdown is what you had in Spain, where nobody was allowed out for weeks. No exercise with thousands of people panting on each other as they jog past each other. That isn't a lockdown. If I'd been in charge of this country, my lockdown would have looked like the Chinese lockdown. And our death toll would look like the Chinese death toll. Instead, we have the second highest death toll in the entire world, the second worst outcome in the entire world. Now, you may think that's a coincidence, or you may think it's just down to the fact that both of the leaders of Britain and the United States are blonde bombshells. Uh, but I prefer not to weave conspiracy theories, not to look in the crystal ball, uh, but to read the book of condolences. You see, the proof of every pudding is in the eating. And the proof of Boris Johnson's government's pudding is in the grave. It's in the grave where 62 or 63,000 people now lie dead. Almost 60,000 deaths above average in the three months. That's all. Not even 11 weeks since this virus hit our shores and this day. So we ain't had no lockdown. And that which we had was effectively abolished by Boris Johnson. And a third of our people are breaking regularly uh, the lockdown. I met people just yesterday, well known to me, uh, who were on their way into somebody's garden party. Now, they may or may not have maintained social distancing, uh, but I was shocked nonetheless because I have not only myself scrupulously observed this lockdown, I've been demanding a lockdown earlier, lasting longer, and being a proper lockdown. It's not a lockdown when you allow 24 million people to fly into Britain, oftentimes from places that are raging with coronavirus infection. Yes, 24 million from New York from Madrid, from Paris, from China, all over the world, 24 million of them. And then they get off the plane, no one even takes their temperature, never mind attempts to quarantine them. They get onto the London underground, uh, where if they've got it, they're infecting half the people in the carriage and killing a significant number uh, of transport staffs. You've not got a lockdown when you haven't even given the bus driver a little mask that he can put on. You haven't got a lockdown when you're instructing the bus driver that he can't keep his front door shut. He's got to take the fares. That's not a lockdown. That's a joke. Now, Dominic Cummings, as I said in the very beginning, is a right-wing libertarian runt who I believe is partly responsible for the herd immunity eugenics project, which I believe has been the policy of our government from the very beginning. But they ran away from the consequences of that uh, when it was signaled to them uh, that uh, openly practicing herd immunity would lead to the deaths, not just of hundreds of thousands of British people, uh, but most of them elderly, and therefore a very good chance of conservative voters. Now, I know there are people out there, probably don't call themselves right wing, but are nonetheless libertarian runts, who in their heart, if they were honest, are prepared to shrug off the fact, like Dominic Cummings, uh, that, uh, well, if some pensioners have to die, so be it. But you see, I don't think it's more acceptable 
to allow the elderly and the infirm and those with underlying conditions to die, I think it's less, less acceptable. Because I happen to believe that there is such a thing as society. Not just me and now, but us and always. And I judge a society on how it treats the most vulnerable of its citizens, don't you? Well, I'm afraid to say there are rather a significant number on the right, but also people who regard themselves on the left, who don't, in the end, actually see it that way. Keir Starmer, for one. Keir Starmer revealed in the Telegraph, behind a paywall, which is his want, uh, that he's been sending his children uh, to school uh, throughout the crisis and that he is backing Boris Johnson, sending all our children, well, except those uh, from the elite who go to the private schools, back to school on the 1st of June. Well, my school-aged children will not be going back on the 1st of June. In fact, as a rough rule of thumb, uh, they will not be going back to school until Eton goes back to school until the children of Jacob Rees-Mogg go back to school, mine will be schooled at home. Where, by the way, the education system has done a pitiful job in keep... Our children could have all been given a laptop computer and education could have continued virtually as normal, at home, nine o'clock to 3.30 every day, but it didn't happen, not here at least though it happened in other countries, like China and like South Korea and like Singapore and many other countries that one never imagined one day we'd be comparing ourselves unfavorably to. Now, of course, the Dominic Cummings is not the only story in the country, though you'd be forgiven for imagining otherwise. There are many other stories, not just in Britain, but breaking around the world. The most important, of course, of those is the absolutely gaping possibility of actual war between the United States and China. You think I'm being fanciful? The United States, having earlier withdrawn from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF, Treaty, has now withdrawn from the Open Skies Treaty, had already withdrawn from the Iran nuclear deal, has effectively scrapped phase two of its trade deal with China, has introduced into its Senate a resolution to delist Chinese companies from the New York Stock Exchange, Individual United States administrations in the States have begun legal proceedings to confiscate hundreds of billions of dollars of China's assets. The United States has gone on to the offensive in Hong Kong, joined by Fat Pang, the fat plutocrat, former governor of Hong Kong from London, thousands of miles away. It's in the papers today, warning China most severely about what it must do in China. Fat Pang, the days when Britain could cut the heads off Chinese people are gone forever. Fat Donald Trump, the days when China can be ordered what to do by you are long gone. That's why when Donald Trump sends his heavy strategic bombing fleet, not making this up, into the South China Sea to join the warships so plentiful they're bumping into each other in the South China Sea, begins a reversal of Richard Nixon's policy 
that there's only one China and that Taiwan is a province of China and begins what are effectively new diplomatic relations and recognition between the United States and Taiwan, whilst ramping up weapons sales from the United States to Taiwan. And when Donald Trump declares economic war against China, this whole scenario rests on one improbable hypothesis. And that is that China will agree to be pushed around, bullied, insulted, and traduced. I'm here to tell you that isn't true. And so the moment is coming fast when China's pushback against the witch hunt <coughs> against China will be contested. It started in Australia, which as one Chinese commentator put it, is the gum on China's shoe. The Australian economy heavily dependent on trade with China, but which joined the United States in its attempt to scapegoat China for the coronavirus has just been stood on like a piece of gum by the Chinese decision to effectively cease all exports of goods and services from Australia to China. Of course, Australia is free to say what it likes, insult China as it likes, but words and actions have consequences, as Australia is about to find out, and as the United States is about to find out too. This is the mother of all talk shows. I'm glad you're with me. I hope you'll stick with us until 10 o'clock London time this evening for the next two and a half hours or more. I'm taking your calls, your tweets. I'm taking your messages. It's the mother of all talk shows. Radio Sputnik. We call Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan the most disruptive radio show in America. It's a great show and we have a lot of fun. We come to you live from Washington, D.C. every Monday through Friday morning. What I like best is that we bring in experts from all over the world. From Barcelona, from Egypt, from Seoul, South Korea. From Newark, New Jersey. We try to bring people great guests, great calls from our listeners, and of course, stupid jokes. And we do it with two hosts that have very different viewpoints. Now, here's the thing, Garland. A lot of people would think you and I would just argue. I mean, I'm a Republican Trump supporter. And of course, I am a progressive Democrat Bernie Sanders supporter. The surprising thing is how much we actually agree on. And you won't be surprised because you're going to find out just how much you agree and just how much you enjoy this show. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Should Dominic Cummings A, be sacked, B, resign, C, stay? Vote now on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. And the phone numbers are 02077 982 255 if you're in the UK, or you can call us from the US on 001-757-744-4480. Get your calls in now because I think this is going to be quite a busy show. It's getting busier in the United States on the streets. Uh, people are uh, being uh, openly encouraged uh, to begin going back to the beach en masse, uh, going back to work, which they have to do because they're effectively being starved uh, back to work. And Donald Trump has just designated churches and mosques and synagogues and other places of religious worship as exempt from the lockdown. So all these evangelical fanatics will no doubt have been out today. And the political scene is warming up too. Joe Biden, I thought, could not get more ridiculous. Uh, but when he declared on television this week that he was going to defeat Joe Biden, I actually believed him for once. Joe Biden is going to defeat Joe Biden. At least that's my view. Let's hear uh, 
the point of view of one of the brightest and the best of US correspondents, Anya Parampil, who is a journalist and broadcaster extraordinaire. I was glad to work with her when uh, she was young and I was old. Now I know she and people like her are the future of journalism and broadcasting in the United States. And it's our good fortune that she's joining me now. Anya, welcome again to the mother of all talk shows. Let's talk about the churches first of all. Were they booming uh, today? Uh, has the exemption on religious uh, places gone down well in the United States? First of all, George, thank you so much for your very kind and warm welcome. Thank you. I'm actually in Washington, D.C., where we're told that we've not necessarily even peaked in terms of the number of cases so far. The mayor, Muriel Bowser, actually said quite a few weeks ago that they weren't expecting us to experience the peak in COVID-19 cases until mid-June. So... In, in Washington, D.C., uh, there was no bustling activity, as far as I'm aware, even though they are slowly discussing, talking about uh, opening up here again. But, George, something I want to note, which was pretty disturbing that I read in a report this week on Reuters, is that the U.S. government, as you may know, is really trying hard to win this race to get the vaccine. And they desperately want to beat China. And one of the initiatives they've actually rolled out is a plan to begin testing the vaccine, get this, George, in Washington, D.C. and in Africa. And <laughs> viewers might not know that Washington, D.C. is actually one of the most historically black or is a historically black city in the United States. And that's changed over recent years with gentrification, but there is still one of the highest homeless populations in the entire country here. And I'm very, very concerned about how this vaccine will be used, to how it will be tested, particularly who will they be testing it on. I fear that they will be testing it on the most vulnerable people in our society, particularly homeless and people who might be desperate to maybe win money or there's also just been such a panic about the virus that people are really, I think, willing to accept anything at this point. Yes, the, uh, the diff main difference between uh, the vaccine that might come out of China and the vaccine that might either come out of the United States or be procured by the United States from other countries using the might of the dollar is that China has said it will produce and distribute its vaccine at cost price to everyone in the world. I don't think that'll happen if one of the multinational US drug companies get their hands on it, do you? No, I, I don't. And it was actually, I believe, an Israeli company this week which said it is a step closer or had some breakthrough on developing the vaccine. I saw reports in Israeli media discussing uh, some of the, the developments there, and then they're going to roll it out, testing. They're asking for, I think, around 100,000 volunteers to test it in the United States. And absolutely, George, the, the way that our healthcare system here works is nothing is free. Even something as desperately needed as this vaccine will only be seen as a cash cow, not, not a chance to go to the World Health Organization or international institutions and actually help treat this virus or help prevent the spread of the virus. So I'm well, pretty the, concerned. The, the, the word vaccine comes from vaca, from cow. Uh, so that's a particularly apposite observation. It'll be a cash vaca uh, yeah. if it is developed uh, in Western countries. Donald Trump has done so badly in this He's now announced that he's taking uh, uh, the, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, even though uh, when it's been used in tests on people suffering from the, uh, the uh, pandemic, uh, has turned out to kill more people uh, than it has cured. In fact, it hasn't cured anybody uh, from the vaccine, but Donald Trump is taking it. I thought he was looking rather purple, I must say, the other day when I saw him on television. It's not so long ago he was implicitly 
suggesting that we inject ourselves with uh, some kind of bleach or disinfectant uh, whilst uh, bathing in ultraviolet light and all the other blunders and missteps and contradictions in his performance. In ordinary times, such a man would have no chance of being re-elected uh, as president in November, given the carnage all around him, 100,000 people uh, already dead being just the uh, tip of the iceberg. Uh, but on the CNN poll this week, Donald Trump is actually ahead, seven points ahead of the Democratic Party. Why might that be? Everything. President Trump, when, when he was elected in 2016, I believe signified a real shift in U.S. politics. I'm not sure that we're ever going to go, going to go back to normal, and I'm not sure that the standard way of an analyzing or viewing an election is ever really going to apply again, at least as long as he's still in the race, especially. And so even while we've experienced this absolute carnage, you said, regarding the COVID-19 outbreak yesterday, the front page of the New York Times, which is not an outlet that I ha hold in very high regard, had listed the names of COVID-19 deaths, and that it just said 100,000 dead, and it listed, the whole front page was just names of dead people who have died as a result of COVID-19. And you would think that this would have a very negative impact on the president, but there are a couple factors here. One is that Trump has been campaigning essentially since the day he took office. He's been campaigning for re-election. While the Democrats were fighting over whether or not to even elect Sanders or Biden, Trump was headed to swing states and holding major rallies up until really the coronavirus shut that down. But even this week, he was in Michigan, which is one of the key battleground states in the United States. I'm not born in Michigan, but I grew up mostly in Michigan, and it's a state very close to my heart. And I believe if you can understand Michigan, you can understand the country because it represents really the what used to be the bastion of U.S. industry and production that was really truly abandoned by the country's elite. Ford Motor Company, GM, Chrysler, they all come from Michigan. It was the hub of production for war parts during World War II, and it was decimated as a result of, of neoliberal economic policies. And for years, for decades, I believe it was since 1988, it was a blue state. It was a state that voted for Obama twice, but it flipped to red and supported President Trump in 2016. And this week, you also probably been hearing about Michigan because it's where some of these, it's where the anti-lockdown movement really began as a as a an opposition to the governor there, Gretchen Whitmer, a Democrat, who did put in place pretty tight measures that really to this day don't even make sense to me, including banning the sale of paint or certain garden supplies. I also was not sure if it was the best decision to have the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is sparsely populated, under the same lockdown measures as Detroit, Michigan. But what it led to was this huge backlash against her. And Trump was actually there this week. He showed up in Michigan. He showed up at a Ford factory where they're now producing medical supplies at one of the, the factories, which announced that it was going to, because of the emergency circumstances, try to produce the the supplies such as ventilators that we need during this crisis. And so that was pretty strong statement, I think, for the president to, to show up in Michigan in this swing state, in a place where people are holding massive weapons of war and actually trying to intimidate elected lawmakers inside the Michigan state capitol. And also Gretchen Whitmer, the governor in Michigan is, I think, a likely vice presidential choice for Joe Biden. He this week announced that he's begun the vetting process on Amy Klobuchar, who you may remember she ran during this last cycle for the Democratic Party's nomination. She's from Minnesota. She's a senator. Uh, she's not the most exciting individual. Gretchen Whitmer just 
maybe I'm biased because I'm from Michigan. She's a bit more of an interesting personality, even though she's not a great progressive Democrat. She's a standard corporate Democrat. She'd be a great pick for Joe Biden. And if he it indeed selects Governor Whitmore, I think it will really bring this, this tension between the anti-lockdown Trump supporters who are all over the country and the issue is that the Democrats aren't putting up a real opposition to that. As we know, they're putting up this phony, corporate, tired, at this point, it's just sad, really, to see Joe Biden. It's, it's well, funny uh, to... It's funny you say that, sad, him. because that's what I felt this week. Uh, it, yeah. it, it started out as farce, uh, but it's now become a bit of a tragedy. Uh, I saw him as I... I wasn't joking earlier. I saw him say... I'm going to beat Joe Biden. He said it. He said it on television. I'm going to beat Joe Biden, he said. Uh, now, can this re is this really credible that this can go on all the way to November, that they really feel this man as their presidential candidate? Or is this all a game and they're going to pull a rabbit uh, out of the hat uh, between now and then, do you think? I would hope that Joe Biden's family steps in. I look at his wife, Jill Biden, and I think, how could you do this to someone who you supposedly love? It's just, to me, elder abuse at this point, the fact that they've kept him out there. He's lucky that he doesn't have to go physically on the campaign mm. trail. I don't know how he'd deal with that at this point. But at the very least, I hope his family steps in and puts an end to his campaign because this is not a way I think someone would want to spend the last few years of their life when their mental capacity has clearly deteriorated. If the family doesn't step in, it's possible, especially if it gets worse or if they really start thinking about putting Joe Biden up in debates against Trump, that they try and think of a way to change the nomination. And already we know, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, however they decide to put together the convention, the party convention this summer in July, when they actually, all the party elite come together to elect officially the nominee, it's possible since it's all going to be online and there are going to be so many first times and, and unanswered questions, people aren't really going to know how to do a convention virtually or what exactly the rules are. I wouldn't put it past them to, and I'm not, I'm not super uh, aware of party rules, but I do think they, at the end of the day, have the right to nominate whoever they'd like. Because, for example, this, some of the super delegates last year, uh, last time around in 2016, who should have voted for Sanders because their constituents back home, actually Minnesota being one of those states which voted for Sanders, the super delegates, Amy Klobuchar being one of them, actually voted for Hillary Clinton to get the nomination in 2016. So they can do that. The party elite, and and we know how corrupt and how just filthy the Democratic elite are, thanks to WikiLeaks. I wouldn't put it past them to find someone else. And for a while, there was this movement to draft Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, who was kind of the main governor who was really clearly running an opposition campaign to Trump from his seat during these press conferences when he was when he was uh, managing and, and dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak. He was really picking the partisan fight and certainly auditioning for that higher up position in the party. And the problem there too, George, is that while we can criticize President Trump all day for the, the steps that he failed to take in order to mitigate this crisis, the main governors... Democratic governors, such as Andrew Cuomo, especially Andrew Cuomo, really failed to manage the crisis themselves. Andrew Cuomo, I, while I and several of my more progressive friends were complaining about all the positive coverage he was getting, finally even The Guardian this week published an article saying, look, Andrew Cuomo is not all that. He, for example, refused to release prisoners. I mean, you would think this is something that a Democratic governor could do very easily, release 
elderly prisoners who have pretty much a zero chance, percent chance of returning to prison or committing a crime and are at risk. Release non-violent uh, or non-offensive uh, um, detainees, people who, there are people, thousands of people in New York jails who haven't even been charged with a crime but are sitting there because they can't make bail or they haven't been found guilty of a crime, I'm sorry. They're sitting in a prison cell waiting to get their trial in the country of the, the, the home of the free. And not even under the circumstances of COVID-19 was that enough to convince Democratic governors such as Andrew Cuomo to compassionately release these individuals. So we've, uh, really we've, uh, we've got one of those uh, here also by the name of yep. Julian Assange. We'll talk about him uh, on another occasion. Anya Parampil, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, now Crazy. the uh, poll, should Dominic Cummings be A, sacked 65%, B, resign 11%, C, stay 24%, 1,470 votes so far. Now, uh, it was, of course, the uh, dismal anniversary, the 72nd anniversary of what the Palestinians called the Nakba, uh, the catastrophe, uh, last week. And I made a short for RT about it. It's getting quite a lot of attention. Take a look at it now. Almost exactly 72 years ago, the name Palestine was wiped off the map. 800,000 Palestinians were driven from their home, from their land, from their country. Almost all of them never to return. Millions of them have lived ever since, either as displaced persons within refugee camps inside their own country, sometimes able to see their own land, their own gardens, their own fruit being picked by foreigners who have come from their homes in America, in England, in France, all the way to their occupied land, or have lived lives of indescribable misery in the neighboring Arab countries without rights and regularly subject to pogrom and further exile. Now the millions of Palestinians are scattered to the four corners of the earth, but they have two things, all of them, in common. First, uh, their presence in any country will forever be insecure just because they are Palestinians in a world with no Palestine. And secondly, all of them, three, four generations on, have never forgotten that they are Palestinians. Like so many other crimes, this crime was authored here in London, in the British Parliament, in a room in which I have sat, in which Mr. Balfour, on behalf of one people, promised to a second people the land belonging to a third people, unique even by the standards of imperialist history. Of course, the Holocaust, the systemized, industrialized attempt to annihilate every last Jew on the planet, in which six million Jews were systematically murdered by Germany, by the then German government, by the government of Adolf Hitler, played a huge role in propelling the Jewish survivors of that Holocaust, not to America and Britain and France where they wanted to go, but were not allowed to go, but to Palestine, to somebody else's land, to live in somebody else's house. Germany, the perpetrator of this, the greatest of all human crimes, was not, after the war, punished at all. As a matter of fact, it has been endlessly rewarded and is now one of the richest and most powerful countries on the earth. Neither were the countries allied with Nazi Germany, like Italy, ever punished for their role in that Holocaust. 
And of course, the countries that slammed their own doors to prevent the fleeing Jews from arriving here were not punished in the slightest. Now there were those who decided not to bomb these death camps, these extermination camps, not to bomb and destroy the gas chambers in which Jewish children, women and men were being incinerated. The only people to be punished were the Palestinians who had absolutely nothing to do with the Holocaust against Jews in Europe in the 1930s and 40s. I became close to the late President Arafat in the summer of 1977. Because of my closeness to him, I always supported from the 1970s the so-called two-state solution, a Palestinian state living side by side with a state of Israel. I even supported the Oslo Agreement, which has crashed and burned in ignominy. But now I'm bound to tell you, after all these decades in which the demography and the topography and the political geography of this tiny piece of land, smaller than one park in South Africa, smaller than the Kruger National Park in South Africa, the whole territory. So many changes have taken place that it's not actually even possible to have that two-state solution anymore. And therefore, for me, it's time to change tack. We should be demanding one democratic, secular state of Israel-Palestine, or Palestine-Israel, with a hyphen between them, in which all Jews, Muslims and Christians, live as equal citizens, with equal rights, under the law and under the Constitution. Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. Well, that was my take. Uh, there was a predictable, organized backlash against it on the social media platforms, but then that comes with the territory. So you can still vote uh, for the next hour and a quarter. Should Dominic Cummings be sacked, resign or stay? 1,790 votes so far, still the same numbers. Sacked 65%, resign 11%, stay 24%. Calls are coming in hotly on this subject. Let's go to the first of them. Jonathan in Stoke-on-Trent on Dominic Cummings. Jonathan, welcome. Hi, George. Uh, big fan of yours since you did the, the speech in the Senate. Thank you, mate. Um, I'd just like to say the, the way the media were behaving, well, what you've seen on TV, it seems really hysterical. Um, so like jumping over each other, breaking their own rules. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. You know, oh, they're literally <laughs> breathing in each other's mouths as they, as they attempt to, uh, uh, to roast a guy for breaking uh, social distancing and lockdown rules. You couldn't make it up. Yeah. It's just, just ironic. And don't forget, it's the, like the same media who found like, Priti Patel guilty as well and calling for her resignation before like, any investigation was conducted. Um, just seems like they think they have the duty to decide themselves when, when someone goes... Um, well, they, they keep speaking out against unelected power, um, as if journalists were not unelected power. And we had the grotesque spectacle today of people, so-called left-wing people, in, for example, Novara Media, hailing the contribution of Alastair Campbell in denouncing Cummings and uh, Johnson. Anyone praying in aid in an argument, Alastair Campbell, as a critic of unelected power in government, actually is either very, very young uh, or has completely lost uh, their sense of, uh, of right and wrong. Jonathan, go on. I mean, I mean, even if Dominic was in the wrong, I mean, what, what happened to having a warning first or 
well, why does everything result in being sacked? I mean, if I did something wrong at work, I'd, I'd normally get like a warning first. It, it, it just seems very hysterical what, what's going on. Well, um, I mean, Britain it, likes not... a, a, a fit of the vapours, I'm afraid. Uh, and decisions made in haste are repented on uh, at leisure. I never doubted for one moment uh, that Boris Johnson would stand by Cummings uh, because he's not Jeremy Corbyn who threw his friends under a bus at the first whiff of grape shot. Uh, Johnson and the Tories in general and the ruling class uh, from which they come and whom they represent uh, are not like that. Uh, they are uh, much more ready to stand up to uh, the kind of frenzy than Corbyn and Macdonald were over, say, Chris Williamson. Chris Williamson was cast into the fire uh, within an hour uh, of the, the uh, story about him uh, breaking. Last word to you, Jonathan. Yeah, well, I, was, I was pleased that he stuck by him. Um, I mean, they've been after Dominic since Brexit. I'm looking for anything to pin on him. That's the main um, reason I mean, no, why the media hate him, because he, he, he's the man that did more than anyone else other than Nigel Farage uh, to I'm, actually win Brexit and then deliver it. I mean, no, no one else visiting the family responsibly would get the same role in news footage. I mean, Stephen Kinnock. Stephen like, Kinnock's on the Labour but, front bench. And he, and, drove, and, and, he drove hundreds of miles, not to isolate with his kid near his parents in case they needed emergency childcare. Stephen Kinnock drove hundreds of miles to wish his father, Lord Kinnock, a happy birthday. And he's sitting on the Labour front bench. I mean, personally, I don't, I don't begrudge him from doing that. He, he did look responsible when he was doing it. He was sitting... Like, well, in the picture, off. yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll in the picture he well. took, yeah. I mean, dur during the strictest part of the lockdown, I, I still saw my parents because I thought if I'm doing the shopping, I trust myself more responsibly to distance from my parents than them going risking themselves in the supermarket. So, I mean, I'd, I'd say I was still visiting my parents during the... Well, uh, as I said earlier, a third, fully one third of the British people admit to uh, mm. surveyors... Uh, that they have broken the lockdown. Jonathan, thanks for the call. Anthony is in Detroit on the China-US track. Anthony, welcome. Go on. Hi, George. Hi. Uh, yeah, well, I definitely can see the you know rhetoric of you know with Donald Trump and all the trade policies he's definitely trying to take on China. Even though you know he always has some weird kind of personality things with the dictators and the leaders of these countries, but. Oh, I just want to say the the people of America, this country, we have absolutely no appetite for a conflict in any country, even though we're already in, what, seven probably across the world, and we would not support him on that one, one inch. Well, uh, I'm sure that that's true uh, in Detroit, uh, but it won't be true everywhere in the United States. Some of your state governments uh, are actually beginning legal action to confiscate China's money. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, my. Like uh, business people? Yeah, well, they, they are uh, in, uh, I can't remember now the name of the, the three states uh, that China has warned uh, that they will retaliate against. They have begun uh, legal moves uh, to freeze Chinese assets in the United States, uh, amounting to hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to compensate the United States for for the coronavirus. Oh my gosh. Now, yeah, uh, I'll tell you, if, if, if that happens, <laughs> if that happens, it's unleashed the dogs of war. Oh, oh, yeah, I didn't hear about all that, to be honest. Anthony, thanks for your call. I must press on because the lines are really busy. Joe, Joe in Newport. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, George. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I can't understand now, this coronavirus was released from a laboratory in um, North Carolina in 2016. You're talking about uh, Fort Detrick. That's the one, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Senate shut it down, and Fauci took it over to China, to Wuhan, and gave him a $3.4 million grant to develop the disease. Now, I'm convinced 
that both him and Bill Gates are in on this. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of it that they're in there so they can sell their viruses and get everybody to have um, an injection just to make more money. Yeah, and um, why are you so convinced of this, Joe? Because all the evidence I found on the internet uh -huh. um, that speaks old, of it. The old internet. Uh, yeah, now, well, it, uh, it, the, the consensus uh, of scientific opinion, medical opinion, is that uh, this virus uh, came from bats. But uh, you, with your uh, learning uh, from the internet, uh, directly contradict that. You know, I think that's a bit risky, Joe. No, I don't believe the, the scientific interest, George. Uh, they said um, uh, Ebola virus come from some sort of monkey. Uh, and the monkey is the science saying monkeying around with things that they shouldn't be monkeying around with. Well, I certainly I mean, agree with that point. They are uh, monkeying around. Uh, with things they shouldn't be monkeying around with. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I'm not for, uh, for uh, getting the monkey. I'm, I'm for getting the organ grinder. And that's uh, why uh, I'm totally unmoved by the frenzy uh, over Dominic Cummings. Thanks uh, very much indeed. Let's squeeze Brent in Southampton in. Go ahead, Brent. Yeah, hello, George. Um... I just want to talk about the issue about the schools reopening again. Um, it seems to me, I just want to know why Rebecca Long Bailey, who's supposed to be Shadow Education Secretary... Is she? I thought she'd retired after her drubbing in the no, Labour she was, leadership. Um, I haven't she heard or seen her since. Yeah. Um, I, did, I did check it before, before I phoned in, actually. <laughs> Okay, um, she did come second in the Labour leadership. Uh, yeah, but um, a long the distance. The person that yeah. became third became Shadow Foreign Secretary. But I just want to know what you think or why you think Rebecca Long Bailey has been so silent on the issue when she's supposed to be the opposition spokesman on education. Could it say something about the state of the Labour left, how they've totally capitulated. Well, uh, it says, uh, speaks volumes uh, to that, Brent. Uh, the, the reality is the Labour Party is uh, not fit for purpose. It's certainly not any kind of opposition, as the last uh, 40 hours has made abundantly uh, plain. Uh, the uh, leader is missing in action. Someone told me he'd had a few coats of lacquer uh, applied to his wooden visage today and couldn't be uh, seen in public in order to speak. Uh, but the Rebecca Long Bailey of whom you speak is a nothing. She was a nothing before. She's a nothing now. It was a grotesque error of John McDonnell uh, to anoint her as the successor candidate uh, to Jeremy Corbyn. It was a grotesque error to insist that there could only be one so-called left candidate forcing Ian Lavery, who had a far better chance than her, uh, out of the race, uh, all on the grounds of identity politics, that the next leader of the Labour Party uh, must be a woman. Why? <laughs> if that woman, uh, Rebecca Long Bailey, is a mere cipher, uh, doesn't add up to a row of beans, is a cardboard cutout, just a smaller one than the cardboard cutout that won it, uh, what was gained for women? Uh, what was gained for uh, the cause of women uh, by insisting that she should be not just the candidate, but the only candidate? She's a damp squib. As I told everybody, publicly and privately, at the time, you see, I'm not speaking in hindsight, Brent. If you're a regular listener, you'll know. I was very clear about it, uh, that if she is your candidate, uh, then Keir Starmer is going to win by a landslide. Now, if I could see that from here, how could the people in the Labour Party not see it, Brent? Last word to you. Well, sadly, when I was a Labour Party member, I did. One of the last things I did was actually vote for her as a candidate for leader. But what I seem to notice, a lot of the problems the Labour Party had, in particular on Brexit, in fact, specifically on that issue, 
a lot of the Labour left were responsible. I mean, I think that the Labour left has its heroes and has its villains. But sadly, for every Ian Lavery, there's a Clive Lewis. For every Eddie Dempsey, there is a um, Owen Jones, for instance. And I think some sections of the Labour left do have to bear responsibility for their sort of ridiculous attitude toward the European Union. How many left-wing reasons were there to oppose the European Union? (laughs) Anti-democratic, neoliberal, anti-imperialist reasons, not to mention the actual referendum. And, you know, it was almost, I was almost bewildered to see people who claim to be on the left supporting an organisation like that. I remember uh, it being said that Jeremy Corbyn was unpatriotic. Wouldn't it have been... I mean, all he needed, really, was an organisation outside the United Kingdom which was hostile to both socialism and the nation-state. Doesn't the European Union fit that? Um, Equally, he was accused of supporting... um, terrorism but wouldn't it what he really needed was a civil war in a country with islamist terrorists on one side and a secular government on the other wouldn't that have helped him out if he'd adopted a position just a little bit like that that would have annoyed a lot of people on the labor right and on the so-called labor left wouldn't it have been great if that had been his tactic rather than the attitude rather than the line that he took. What do you mean by a civil war with Islamist uh, uh, extremists on one side? What do you mean by that? Well, in Syria, there's a civil war between you've got yeah. Islamic extremists yeah. on one side. He should, he should have been and much clearer on, government on the other. He, he has completely ignored that subject. Uh, he could have been the man standing up to uh, the Islamist fanatic terrorists in Syria and denouncing our government for arming them, funding them, proselytizing for them. Couldn't he? Absolutely. I mean, just a moment ago, or and on your um, Workers' Party show, which I sometimes listen to, you mentioned Palestine, and you talked about uh, there were people who accused Jeremy Corbyn of um, being in league with ki- people who'd killed British soldiers. But weren't there... British soldiers in the King David Hotel in 1948. What about Uh, the people who launched that attack? 93 of them, uh, to be precise, soldiers and civil servants. Uh, Brent, a very interesting call. Uh, Don't be a stranger. Uh, Call back soon uh, on another subject, on uh, another show. Uh, Should Dominic Cummings, A, be sacked? That's 63%, down two. Uh, Resign, 12%, up one. And stay, 25%, up one. And 1,925 of you have voted. And you've still got one hour uh, to get your vote in. But first, the news with Jamie Lowe. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Tune in every Tuesday to Loud and Clear for a regular segment called False Profits, a weekly look at Wall Street and corporate capitalism, where we talk about the big economic issues of the week from the point of view of working people, the poor, and the U.S. position in the global economy. Join us this Tuesday and every Tuesday with financial policy analyst Daniel Sankey right here on Radio Sputnik. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money-related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio 
Radio Sputnik News. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson began his press conference with a statement of support for his controversial chief advisor Dominic Cummings, who broke lockdown rules in March. Mr Cummings drove 260 miles to Durham with his family to be near relatives when he and his wife developed symptoms of COVID-19. Speaking at the Daily Downing Street press conference, the Prime Minister said that Mr Cummings had followed the instincts of every father and every parent and that he had acted responsibly, legally and with integrity. Labour has called for an urgent inquiry into the allegations, while government ministers have rallied around Cummings and defended his conduct. Matt Hancock and Michael Gove were among those to back Cummings for self-isolating at a property adjacent to other family members in case he and his wife needed help with childcare during the lockdown. On Saturday, Cummings told reporters outside his home that he would not be resigning and that he had done the right thing. But despite the support from the Prime Minister and Conservative front benches, several MPs from his own party have called for Dominic Cummings to quit. The influential Tory MP Steve Baker is among eight backbenchers to publicly question his position. There's only a 50% chance of the Oxford coronavirus vaccine working because cases in the UK are declining so fast. One of the scientists behind it has warned. The University of Oxford's Jenner Institute and the Oxford Vaccine Group began developing a COVID-19 vaccine in January using a virus taken from chimpanzees, which they hoped to market by September. But with the number of UK coronavirus cases dropping every day, there may not be enough people to test it on, according to the Institute's director, Professor Adrian Hill. He told a Sunday newspaper, it's a race against the virus disappearing and against time. We said earlier in the year that there was an 80% chance of developing an effective vaccine by September, he added, but at the moment there is a 50% chance that we will get no result at all. We are in the bizarre position of wanting COVID to stay at least for a little while. The trial of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on corruption charges has opened in Jerusalem today, just days after he began a new term in office. 70-year-old Netanyahu is the first standing leader to face trial in the country's history. He denies accusations of bribery, fraud and breach of trust. As he arrived at the courthouse for a brief hearing, he said the cases were aimed at toppling him in any way possible. He was sworn back into office as head of a rare unity government a week ago. His political rival Benny Gantz agreed to share power following three inconclusive elections in under a year. He has rejected calls by opponents to step down while he fights the case. Police have fired tear gas at protesters in Hong Kong after hundreds of demonstrators clashed with security officials in the Wan Chai district over Beijing's proposals to set up government intelligence bases in the territory. Protesters were seen cowering behind umbrellas as officers with shields fired the gas to try to disperse crowds of activists and journalists carrying free Hong Kong signs. China says it wants to prevent a repeat of last year's riots, which were triggered by a bill that would have allowed islanders to be extradited to the mainland. The government says the laws are necessary to prevent, stop and punish such protests in the future after the last demonstrations crippled the territory for months. Millions of Muslims around the world are marking the end of Ramadan with the Eid al-Fitr celebration. The festival of the breaking of the fast is one of Islam's two major holidays. It begins when the moon rises on the final day of Ramadan, a holy month of fasting. But with many countries still under coronavirus restrictions, Eid is looking very different for many people this year. As the start of the festival depends on the sighting of the new moon, the first day of Eid varies between countries. Somalia and Kenya began celebrating on Saturday. Indonesia and Thailand held Eid prayers today. But in some parts of the world, Muslims are still fasting and won't mark Eid until tomorrow. And finally, an alligator believed to have once belonged to Adolf Hitler has died in a Moscow zoo. The zoo said the reptile called Saturn was around 84 years old when he died on Friday. Saturn was born in Mississippi in the US and was later gifted to Berlin Zoo, from which he escaped when it was bombed in 1943. His whereabouts were unknown until 1946 when British soldiers found him and gave him to the Soviet Union. Almost immediately, the myth was born that he was allegedly in the collection of Hitler and not in the Berlin Zoo, Moscow Zoo said in a statement. Saturn apparently loved the brush massage and if something was not to his liking, he could gnaw apart steel feeding tongs and concrete decorations. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik, Sputnik. 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 S
the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. Exactly three years ago, I was in the Manchester Town Hall registering the birth of my daughter, my youngest daughter, Orla. Little did I know, or anyone know, I hope, uh, that as I was there registering my little girl's uh, birth, a demon was making his way uh, from his safe house, strapped with explosive devices, intent on murdering other people's little girls and boys, and indeed several parents and staff of the Manchester Arena. 22 innocents were slaughtered exactly three years ago in the heinous attack on the Manchester Arena by a Manchester born and raised and educated individual. I'm not going to say his name. I was less than a mile from the Manchester Arena when the explosion happened. And I will never forget the sheer horror as the news spread that an attack on children at the Ariana Grande concert in the Manchester Arena had been mounted. And the horror on discovering uh, that the mass murderer had lived amongst us all of his life. I knew the community from which he sprang. I called them a community, but they were in fact a cell, a cell of fanatic extremists assembled by successive British governments and placed in Manchester to await a time when they would be of value uh, to British foreign policy and the British intelligence services. And that time came when the uh, so-called revolution to overthrow Gaddafi and his government in Libya, this was the hour. And the control orders that had been placed upon this group of dangerous extremists were lifted. Their passports were returned. Uh, the family of the mass murderer, the child killer, uh, were amongst those. Encouraged, no, sent back to Libya to join the revolution to overthrow uh, the government of Colonel Gaddafi. I raise these matters because no one has been held to account for the policy choice of successive British governments from the 1980s onwards that were based on the absolutely immoral principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend. Even if your enemy's enemy is even more repulsive than your original enemy. And we've been across this course now so many times before. In the 1980s, at the same time as we were planting this cell in Manchester, similar kinds of people became our friends in Afghanistan on precisely the same principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend. So we built a Frankenstein monster in Afghanistan, but we also built one closer to home in Manchester and the lives and limbs of our children were torn to pieces by that monster that we created. My good friend and colleague Afshan Ratansi is the host of the RT flagship show, Going Underground, quite the best thing on the network. And I'm glad to say, having followed this story throughout as he has, that he joins us now. Afshan, welcome to the mother of all talk shows. It's a melancholy subject, uh, alas. Uh, but I'm right, Amantai, 
uh, that the uh, community of killers harbored by British governments in Manchester ended up killing our children. Well, it's a privilege to be on, uh, George. Yes, I, I think you are right. And, uh, you know, in fairness, honorable exceptions to the journalists commemorating today's anniversary and the anniversary this week. I mean, Peter Oborn, the journalist, uh, actually said, there is every reason to speculate that, uh, that what happened, the evil handiwork, was in part a direct consequence of MI6 meddling. Now, that would come as a huge shock to uh, any of the families who are bereaved, let alone the population at large. But the narrative that this is some lone bomber at the Manchester Arena is falling apart. And I should also say that uh, during this time of coronavirus, lost amidst the lockdown warnings, etc., were the uh, final release of court filings from the case of the only person to be convicted of the Manchester atrocity, the brother of the bomber. And in it, it says it was Boris Johnson who allegedly, allegedly as foreign secretary, paid uh, 9.2 million pounds of British taxpayers' money as part of an aid package to get uh, the person who would uh, then be convicted, who was convicted in, in March of the atrocity. So what, what are these connections? And I think you've outlined a little of how uh, the intelligence services facilitated travel between Manchester and Libya, the British government's obsession, their failed attempt to assassinate Gaddafi, after uh, which they brought back uh, these elements of, uh, of extreme uh, Salafism and Wahhabism, who would then later on go on to Syria uh, as part of the rebels, uh, sponsored and supported definitely by British media, American media. I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, the hypocrisy with which the outrage is expressed is uh, astonishing, given, as you uh, intimated, we have so many previous examples of uh, uh, involvement, directly or indirectly, from the security services in atrocities, and no less figure, no less than a figure than uh, Steve Hilton, David Cameron's former senior foreign policy advisor. He said, "If there's, if uh, he, he actually said Theresa May was responsible for the security failure of Manchester, and that she should be resigning, not seeking re-election." She, of course, was Home Secretary during the Manchester atrocity. Their name was the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. The clue was in the name, wasn't it? Yes, and uh, also to be noted here is the switching of sides here, whereas in Afghanistan, arguably, Britain has consistently supported what would become uh, al-Qaeda, and in Syria has uh, consistently supported, arguably, what would become ISIS-Daesh and al-Qaeda. In Libya, under Tony Blair, we had uh, a rapprochement with Gaddafi and the uh, privatized uh, fossil fuel company BP's involvement. I should also add, Labour Party very strongly involved in this, the Kurz Lake Inquiry was supposed to investigate the circumstances around the Manchester Authority. Who is Lord Kurz Lake? None other than a top civil servant who advised John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn. And uh, no surprise, arguably, that you won't hear from Corbyn or McDonnell about Libya when they were in any chance of getting any power in this country. They were being advised by the man who did the inquiry into the atrocity and brought out arguably a whitewash that did not mention MI6 and MI5 involvement in bringing and uh, facilitating the Libyan fighting group. Shocked, I tell you. Uh, now, even at the, the minute level of detail of this particular child killer, uh, there are a number of questions, as I say, I was living there at the time, uh, that have never been answered satisfactorily uh, for me. Uh, for example, uh, this individual, the child killer, uh, was repeatedly reported to the authorities, mainly, I should say, from other Muslims in the Manchester area, including in his own mosque, but also his school teachers, repeatedly reported to the British authorities as a potentially dangerous, uh, radicalized 
fanatic. Uh, but nothing was done uh, to monitor this person. On the contrary, he was given his passport back by Theresa May and was uh, facilitated, waved through uh, the airports uh, of this country as long as he went to Libya to fight uh, Gaddafi. There's so many unanswered questions. Uh, God forbid if I was the parent of one of those children uh, that was killed, I'd be looking for a bit more noise from the political class on this option. Yes, and uh, uh, I suppose there are valiant, uh, uh, bereaved members still fighting for truth, of course, in, in Lockerbie. And it should also be said, we had a killing of a former soldier just near where I'm speaking to you from, Lee Rigby. Yes. Similar yes. questions over MI5, MI6, facilitating of travel of jihadis. And then there's the question, and you're right, there are so many questions, albeit that we do have uh, the court filings now, which were made public in March, finally. We, we have questions about why the New York Times was able to publish pictures of the remains of the uh, improvised explosive device and the British uh, police, uh, the Manchester police, saying this wasn't helpful. Rex Tillerson, the former boss of Exxon, who was uh, Trump's then Secretary of State, saying, yeah, we leaked, uh, we leaked that information. And I've got to tell you that that... Uh, facilitating of the uh, extradition of the person who was eventually who has eventually been convicted he claims and his barristers claimed he was tortured in libya with the connivance of the intelligence services which means that our current prime minister boris johnson is alleged to have been part of a 9 million pound payoff to get the person who was convicted back here in safe hands, and he was interrogated, allegedly tortured, in a way that could only have been with the, uh, with the connivance of the intelligence agencies as questions that were being asked of this, uh, this uh, brother of the person that blew himself up in Manchester. Apparently, those questions could only have come from, uh, it was called uh, uh, a particular type of uh, police operation. These are the allegations of Stephen Camlish, as I say, only unsealed these allegations uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, so perhaps lost. What was Boris Johnson's role in getting this guy convicted? And why was uh, the US State Department so interested in getting someone? Was it to stop these wider questions? Was it the well, fact uh, that they yeah. have other assets in Manchester? Well, staying on the micro level, uh, the person who's been convicted uh, in March uh, was convicted as an accomplice, uh, but he was not. He was not in the country uh, when this bomb was assembled, uh, and it's my understanding of the technicalities involved uh, that the child killer himself could not have created uh, these devices, and that therefore there is someone else, likely at large. And yet there has never been any manhunt uh, or any photo fits, any drawings, artists' impressions. It's as if, from my point of view, they wanted to cover this story uh, with, uh, with the conviction of the brother, the incineration uh, of the mass murderer himself. End of story. I, am I, I, am I being too to suspicious? Well, I know we're refraining from mentioning the name, but I'll mention the name of one person, the father, Ramadan Abedi. Because is it true? This is the question we would ask of the intelligence services as we do on our TV programs. Of course, they never come back. Was he ever an asset of the British intelligence services, Ramadan Abedi? Because he's a British Libyan dual national who has disappeared. And uh, it was he who took the person who blew himself up at Manchester Arena first as a teenager to uh, fight against Gaddafi's government. I should add, of course, the Libya of Gaddafi, the richest per capita African country, and now, of course, in uh, utter chaos. So where is Ramadan Abedi? Why are the police, why are the intelligence services, why is the press not seeking to interview him? I'll tell you, we were the first people on Going Underground to speak to Musa Ibrahim, a Gaddafi spokesperson. We went to Berlin. We went to ask him 
for the first time because no one knew where he was. He disappeared. And uh, he was, uh, you can see our interview on YouTube, he was very clear about the British involvement in uh, jihadi groups, in uh, Salafist groups that uh, were trying to overthrow Gaddafi. Uh, lastly, and I'm grateful for your time, uh, my friend, uh, the, uh, going to the macro. Uh, how do you account for this zigzag in British state policy uh, towards Gaddafi? Uh, we were, as you alluded earlier, or you referred to earlier, uh, we were in the 80s trying to murder uh, Gaddafi, paying for terrorists to blow him up. Uh, but then under Tony Blair, uh, Gaddafi became our new best friend. Uh, our prime minister was kissing him, literally, in tents in the desert. Uh, British businesses were flooding there. Uh, for contracts and so on. And yet, when the so-called Arab Spring uh, broke out, it didn't take long uh, to send uh, the dogs of war from Manchester and elsewhere to tear uh, Gaddafi to pieces. What happened, do you think, in, the, in that moment uh, when our state policy towards Libya changed? In fairness to President Obama, he did try and stick with the Egyptian dictator, Osni Mubarak, as, as long as he could, despite any old demonstrations in Cairo. Yeah, I think uh, what Musa Ibrahim told me was that it's a lesson for governments that do not follow the Washington consensus worldwide, what happened to Libya, and uh, one that can be learned by President Assad in Syria, can be learned by uh, the government in Iran, the government in Venezuela, even the government in China let alone maybe the government in Moscow, you cannot compromise with the Washington consensus. No compromises can be made with these NATO governments. That's what he was telling me, because that's what happened with Tony Blair, the fossil fuel, the company BP that, of course, has such a terrible legacy as the Anglo-Irish, Anglo-Iranian uh, oil company uh, and BP. We, we know that uh, that BP deal was just part of other geopolitical strategies by uh, NATO governments. So I suppose one lesson from all of this for the developing world in the global south is don't negotiate with imperialism. And uh, the sad and terrible, tragic lesson for uh, people here in Britain is the government must realize that uh, the people will understand foreign policy can create atrocities here at home, which is accepted in uh, every department in Whitehall, amongst all the officials in the Foreign Office, but in the media, no, it's just down to lone gunmen, lone bombers. These are outliers not connected to the British state. Afsun Ratansi, host of Going Underground, a must watch on RT. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, now we're talking about uh, the Dominic Cummings affair, which of course, is uh, intimately linked to our handling uh, of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the second worst in the whole world. And the missing 22 days when the British government, led by Boris Johnson, willfully neglected to take steps that would have saved the lives of tens of thousands of our own citizens. For me, Never mind about resignations of monkeys. The organ grinder, the prime minister, and his government should be on trial for the grotesque errors of omission and commission in their handling of the coronavirus pandemic. I need your calls on that, 02077 982255 or you can call us from the US on 001-757-744-4480. And you can tweet us, of course, at George Galloway, at RTUK News, at the mother of all talk shows, TV. Should Cummings be sacked? 62% down one. 12% say he should resign. Uh, that stays the same. And stay in place, 26% up. One two thousand two hundred and seventy nine votes in so far. You've still got half an hour uh, to 
get your call in. Let's take a very, very brief break. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. The world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Thank you. Uh, now you're watching or listening to episode 49 of the mother of all talk shows. Episode 49 on this, the biggest of all platforms, of course. The mother of all platforms speaking to the entire world, to an audience exponentially greater uh, than that achieved by any other current affairs radio show in the country. As a matter of fact, uh, with half a million minimum viewers every week, plus those that are listening on FM, on AM, online, this dwarfs any other current affairs show that you've heard about probably endlessly today. Sophie Ridge, forget about it. Mar, forget about it. This is the place to be, thanks to you. Now, 02077 982 255, that's the number to call. Now, this was the week that was. We've all become blasé about communicating with each other by texting on our phones. In fact, I'm not sure there's any other purpose for a phone nowadays. I so rarely get a telephone call, don't you? It was on this day, though, in 1844, uh, that the, uh, the inventor of the telegraph, there's some important words missed out here, uh, tapped out what hath God wrought in what was the world's first telegraph message. So the world's first telegraph message was sent on this day in 1844, and that was the message. What hath God wrought? What a profound question indeed, though there was no question mark in it. Uh, also on this date in 1988, the UK Parliament passed what was known as Section 28, prohibiting the quote-unquote promotion of homosexuality, unquote. This was repealed in 2003. On the 25th of May in 1914, the British House of Commons passed the Irish Home Rule Bill, which never really came to pass. Exactly 21 years later, the legendary black athlete Jesse Owens equaled or broke four world records in 45 minutes at Ferry Field in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a place where I have given a speech or two as it happens. It's remembered as the greatest 45 minutes ever in sport. That's uh, quite something. Owens equaled or broke four world records in 45 minutes on this day, 21 years later. So that's uh, 1935, just before he went and won all those gold medals at the Berlin Olympics. Although Celtic supporters might quibble with that, greatest ever, 45 minutes, uh, because on the same day in 1967, the team from Glasgow became the first British team to win the European Championship, beating the favourites Internazionale Milan 2-1, who could forget it. And all of the Celtic players, incidentally, came from within 30 miles of Glasgow. And this was the week in 1967 that the Beatles album, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band came out. It went to number one for 15 weeks in the United States and 22 weeks in the United Kingdom. Sadly, I remember it all 
as if it were yesterday. On the 27th of May in 1940, a flotilla of small boats began the evacuation of more than 300,000 British and Allied troops from the beaches of Dunkirk. It features heavily in my novel, Queensway, the sequel to which I'm working on now called Black Lake. Uh, but if you want the uh, novel, Queensway, and you want it dedicated and signed, then you need to contact me at info at georgegalloway.com or you can buy it directly from Amazon. Now, on the same day in 1972, so that's the 27th of May, 1972, what would become known as Watergate occurred when so-called plumbers from Richard Nixon's White House broke into the Democratic National Headquarters in their building in Washington. Even more sad, I remember that as if it were yesterday too. Uh, on the 29th of May in 1953, which I'm glad to say I don't remember, Edmund Hillary from New Zealand and the Nepalese Sherpa Tenzing Norgay were the first climbers to reach the top of the 29,000 foot Mount Everest. It was also the week, a year after Celtic had done it, that Manchester United became the first English club to win the European Championship, beating the Portuguese side Benfica by four goals to one. And finally, on the 30th of May 1981, the Bangladesh president, Zia Rahman, was assassinated by a faction of officers of the Bangladesh army. Now, should Cummings be sacked? My goodness, the votes are flooding in. Uh, get yours in uh, in the next 25 minutes. In fact, let's go straight to the calls because there are so many of them. Uh, Sean is in Leeds on the events at the Manchester Arena. Sean, welcome. Hi there, George. It's smashing to talk to you again. I hope I find you OK. Yes, by the grace of God, I'm in good form. Thanks. Good. I'm pleased to hear it. Yeah, I would just like to know why um, Sky reporter uh, Alex Crawford, who is actually Al-Qaeda's pin-up girl, yeah. uh, has not been sent to Manchester to interview victims of the Manchester bombers. That's a very good point, uh, you know, uh, yeah. because I was going to make that point to Afsan, but we were running out of time. Uh, I, I will never forget uh, the Sky News pickup trucks with Alex Crawford in the back, her That's hair right. blowing in the wind thrilling to uh, the uh, fanatic terrorists racing up the highway with her. And I remember saying at the time to the person watching with me, which part of the slogans they're shouting does Alex Crawford not understand? But of course George, she, under she exactly understood them only too well, Sean. She did, and she's, and she's now in Syria. Uh, spreading the poison in Syria as well now. Um, she I loves, exactly she loves an Al-Qaeda. She's never met an Al-Qaeda that she doesn't love. Yeah, I agree entirely with you. I agree entirely with you. And, and she actually uh, should know these killers in actual fact um, from the Al-Qaeda and Libyan Islamic fighting group, as you said, because she was travelling on the back of pickup trucks with them. And yet nothing has been said about this whatsoever, that she's been cavorting with terrorists. Well, of course, the entire media was then and are now. Uh, the entire media uh, is in bed with Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria. As yeah, the entire certainly. media was in bed with the parents of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan in the 1980s, I know, because I was fighting them. Yeah, you couldn't make it up, really. You could not make it up. And could I just say as well, which of the two main jokers uh, in Libya should uh, who call themselves government, should the UK be supporting? Should it be supporting? Well, if only it was two, Sean. It's four. Uh, there's four governments Government. in, uh, in Libya. We've lost you, but thanks. A great call. There's four governments in Libya. Three prime ministers. Couldn't make it up, as Sean says. Let's go to California, I wish we could, where Roman is on the line on the United States. Go ahead, Roman. Hey, George, a uh, big fan. I, I, I love your show. You're, Thank you. You have great insight. Thank you. And uh, I, just, I just had a question about, it seems like we're facing a new kind of stage of, you know, both censorship and the rise of authoritarian powers. So I just had a quick question about 
the rise of what seems to be new. Have we lost that call? What a pity. Uh, sounded like, like it was going to be interesting, so do try and get back to him. Uh, we've got an email from Joe. Uh, George, you've raised this many times before. Uh, let no one in the UK ever call someone on benefits a scrounger. Those that have taken government money as follow should remember that. It can happen to any of us. It's not a benefits lifestyle, it's life in poverty. And hopefully those in the situation now will never judge others. Almost all of us are just one paycheck away from poverty. If that paycheck, for any reason, doesn't appear, poverty is the likely result. Now, uh, we've got Roman back on the line. Roman, carry on where you left off. You were saying that there's, hey, a, George, new, uh, you were saying there's a new stage in America. Describe it, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like we're having a rise of neo-feudalism almost, where it's growing authoritarian and kind of, you know, censorship and everything like that. So I was just wondering, it seems that with the whole coronavirus and this lockdown, the ability to peaceful protest, this kind of new stage of America is doesn't seem there. So I was just curious of how you would kind of advise us well, kind of I, I, I advise against uh, peaceful protest in the middle of a pandemic uh, when the interests of public health uh, demand that we socially distance uh, from each other. It's not rocket science. Uh, uh, if the, the closer I get within spitting distance of the more people, uh, the more chance I have of passing it on or getting it. Uh, so uh, I've got no sympathy with those out peacefully protesting or protesting with weapons, as is more often the case, Roman, in the United States. We'll have to yeah. peacefully protest on Zoom for the moment, uh, but the day will come uh, that we will be uh, protesting again, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, we've it lost just seems Roman like... again. No, we've got him. Go ahead, Roman. Yeah, yeah no, it just seems like... Uh, you know, the, by the week, our rights are being diminished and everything like that. So I'm just hoping, you know, by the time we can actually walk around, it's not some eight, 1984 kind of like no. Orwell state well, it will that be, we're living in. It, it will be if we allow that uh, to uh, happen, and it won't be if we don't. Roman, thanks for the call. Federico is in London on COVID-19. Go ahead, sir. Hello, George. I uh, have been a mathematician since 1978 in teaching okay. in the schools here. I have been using a system of percentages of the statistics which speaks very clearly, very easily, as to what is actually happening with coronavirus throughout the world. And I have been following the statistics available um, ever since the, the, they came up on the Internet. Um, the, the country in which you are most likely to die of coronavirus, if you catch it, is Belgium with 16.25%. That's number one. Uh, if 16.25% of people who, who catch the virus in Belgium die of it. And number two is UK with 14.18%. So we are the second in the world after Belgium. Now, some examples of the lower end, Russia, only 1% of those who catch the disease have died, who have caught the disease. And uh, in a country such as Vietnam, with 97 million population and 1,000 kilometer border with China, there has only been 325 infections and zero deaths. Zero. Zero, Zero deaths in Vietnam. In Viet not one single Vietnamese has died of coronavirus. And how they did it was they heard about the outbreak in China on the 30th of January. They immediately closed the 1,000-kilometer border. They immediately grounded all aircraft flights from into Vietnam and out of Vietnam. And they sent the entire 97 million workforce into their homes and said, you stay there. And they opened thousands of food centers and they have been feeding the people for free. 
Yes, uh, it's called socialism, uh, Federico. Uh, the it's socialist, uh, yes, the socialist government of Kerala, uh, a state in India, uh, India with a socialist yes. government, has yes. equally been one of the most successful in the entire world. And this in Absolutely. a country led by Modi, uh, India, which is going down the plug uh, with yes. mass starvation and yes. mass coronavirus deaths. Million. 450 million people in India live on the margins of railway yeah. lines. Yeah. They are born there, they grow up there, they eat there, they procreate there, and they die there. Half of all the children, million. Federico, half of all the children all the in children. India are malnourished. Yeah. Yes. Half. And they pride themselves on being such a great democratic country i don't know what democracy really means well anymore. if democracy means half your children are hungry and malnourished <laughs> uh, it doesn't have a lot to say for it uh, but uh, china became socialist in the same year more or less that india became independent compare later, 19, and contrast yeah. china yeah, with india for the life yeah. of the masses in china yeah. or india well, the, 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 one of the things, one of the another statistics, which is not necessarily relevant to this, but if I may say, there are there are 266 million square meters of solar cells put, you know, in, in on houses and etc. in the world. Of that 266 million square meter, seventy percent uh, are installed in China on China's land. And we are constantly being told that the Chinese are the greatest polluters in the world, while they actually have 70% of the world solar power, renewable energy. Yeah. Great call, Federico. I loved it. And uh, don't be a stranger. Let's go to Carlos in Los Angeles. Go ahead, Carlos. Hi, George. How are you? Uh, great to talk to you. Uh, I'm again. wonderful. And, uh, Thank you. Good I'm to hear you. Good to hear you too. So I have this one of my, uh, this uh, idea that I got from the New York uh, Institute of Technology, uh, which uh, correlates the BCG vaccination, which is the Bacille Calmet-Kerin, which is uh, a vaccine that they put uh, to treat tuberculosis. And, uh, and they found a correlation between BCG vaccination and the reduce of morbidity and mortality for COVID-19. So the study was, was done by Aaron Miller, and um, people are trying to understand why they see so many cases in countries like Russia and not that many deaths. And they see many cases in the U.S. and a tremendous amount of deaths in the U.S. And I believe it is because of the BCG vaccination, because um, I got this from the Public Health Agency of Canada. And you can double check it in the BCG Atlas. Uh, I will. Uh, it's, and, uh, uh, it's very interesting. I haven't heard the, uh, the acronym uh, BCG uh, for a long time, but uh, I remember getting it. I remember getting a BCG oh, injection. Body? Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, because yeah. They, don't, they don't have it right now currently applied in the U.S. Like, they don't have a BCG vaccination policy. They have one in Brazil. They have one in Russia. They don't have one in the U.K., in Spain and Italy, which, which are like the six uh, countries that have the most deaths, I mean the most cases, but the, uh, but the, death, the death rates change. For example, in, in, in the U.S. there is, as of a little bit ago, I checked it from the John, Hawk, John Hopkins Institute, there is 97,000 dead people in the U.S. And in Brazil, which is the second one with most cases, there's only 22,000 uh, dead people so it's like five times less than the u.s very very in interesting very very interesting but indeed carlos i'll ask uh, our doctor right? ranji about that in the final hour thanks for the call a guy is in stoke on trent on manchester go ahead guy yes hi george hi uh, peter oborn who used to be the political editor for the telegraph so i'm sure we must his credentials must be valid reference. Oh, yes, he's a senior journalist and a senior conservative thinker and writer. Absolutely, yeah. Now, in 2017, he published an article in the Daily 
Mail, which again is a right-wing respected paper, and he was very critical of MI6 uh, and the part it played in facilitating um, young or people from this country to go over to the Middle East and fight. Yeah. Uh, now, my question is, now, if this information was put out there in the Daily Mail, why hasn't why haven't other people picked up on it? Why well, it, it only happens. Well, only you get. It's a peculiar synthesis, guy. Uh, if you get a story like that, it needs to then be raised in Parliament uh, by people with a big voice, preferably in Parliament, by front bench opposition uh, people in Parliament, by respected backbench government critics on the other side, uh, and then you get more coverage. Uh, then some new facts come out, and you raise that in Parliament, and that gets more coverage. That's how it works. But what we have in the case of the Manchester Arena and the Libyan uh, imbroglio in general is zero, zero agitation in Parliament by Labour or Conservative. I must say, uh, Crispin Blunt, Sir Crispin Blunt, the former head of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, did lead an investigation which concluded uh, that the British involvement in the disaster that has become Libya uh, was to be condemned, uh, was a total failure, and was based on an absolutely false uh, prospectus. Uh, but he was then removed as the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, and a new guy, Tugan Hat, who is all out for war uh, with China, uh, got the gig. But the Labour opposition has done nothing uh, to highlight these issues. Even on this anniversary of the murder of 22 of our uh, children in Manchester. Last word to you, Guy. I'm, I'm presuming that it was too controversial for in 2017, that would have been uh, Jeremy Corbyn led Labour Party. Did they consider it too controversial? No, on, 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 the, on the contrary, uh, Jeremy Corbyn gave a powerful speech in the aftermath of the attack on the Manchester Arena. Uh, during the uh, brief interregnum, uh, when open campaigning was postponed, and Jeremy Corbyn was, it was one of his finest hours. And the right wing of the Labour Party were literally, as he was speaking, predicting uh, that it would be disaster for Labour at the polls, given the critique of British foreign policy that Jeremy Corbyn made in the aftermath of the Manchester Arena, only to find that he came within uh, 2,700 votes of being the Prime Minister and would have been the Prime Minister if not for the betrayals of his own friends. Guy, thanks for the call. John is in Benidorm. Let's hear from him. John. Hello, George. Welcome. Welcome. I'd like to talk about um, the affair at the moment with the government's advisers and uh, the lack of accountability, <laughs> the government's getting away with murder because very few... Uh, commentators will, will press. Uh, there's only three. You're the first. Piers Morgan's the second. And the guy who used to be on Daily Politics, which for some reason the BBC took off air. Andrew Neil. Neil. What yep. was his name? Andrew Neil. Andrew Neil, that's right. Yep. They're, they're, they are the only three who, who the politicians feared who would try and get at the truth. Well, I mean, it's good of you to say so. It's true, uh, as it happens. I can think of no one else to join that list. Uh, no, as a matter well, of fact, I'm trying to persuade, uh, and here's breaking news, I'm trying to persuade Piers Morgan uh, to run as mayor of London. Yeah, because, I don't agree with everything in all no, his politics. Neither do I. Neither do I. But he's got the guts. He's got but the he, guts. He'd be a much better mayor of London than the absolute cipher that we've got sitting there now, who can't yeah. even be seen above the desk. 
Yeah, last time I phoned you, I think it was January, and a lot's happened to me. Uh, I've been in a Spanish hospital for for uh, three and a half weeks. I, w- I was in my bedroom uh, on January the 9th. No, sorry, February the 9th, and I couldn't breathe. Um, so the next, and I had a terrible night, I was sweating and I couldn't breathe. So the next day I went to, to my local clinic and they rushed me to the hospital in Billahosa and said I had pneumonia. Wow. But, but I didn't. I had to call, I had the plague. Oh dear. And, and how long and were you in for, John? I was in for nine days. And then they transferred me to Alicante Hospital, and I had a double heart bypass. Goodness. And I came out just before the lockdown in Spain at the first week of March. I was out, and I was fit as a fiddle. Well, not fit as a fiddle. Well, but you're I sounding to... uh, remarkably spry for a man that's had uh, a few months like you have. John, God bless I'm, you. I'm, I'm, Stay I'm, safe. I've just had my 76th birthday. Wonderful. Happy I, I, birthday, I, belatedly. <laughs> but uh, I, I like to congratulate the Spanish health system. Uh, although the, there was one thing towards the end of my stay which I think helped to spread the virus in Spain. I don't know if you know it, but most of the Spanish hospitals don't have big wards. They have small side wards with two or three beds in. But they're very lax on the amount of visitors. I only had three visitors, unfortunately, when I was there. Uh, My ex-wife and a couple of girlfriends came to see me. But the guy in the, the Spanish guy in the bed next to me had at least 15 visitors coming in and out, and I think that helped to spread the pandemic because it was the first week of March, and like England, the Spanish was a little bit slow of getting into gear about it, and I think um, I think a lot of it was spread by the amount of visitors that they allowed into wow. the Spanish hospitals. Okay, but uh, they took care of you, and that's good news. John, thanks uh, for that. I'm going to Morecambe, from Benidorm to Morecambe, one holiday resort that we used to go to. Morecambe, the holiday resort that we'll all now be going to. David in Morecambe. Go ahead, David. Hello, good evening. Uh, George, a question for you. Yeah. Uh, John Cummings, um, on the television today, this morning, um, the journalists were mobbing his car, a mob of 20, maybe 30 or more journalists, yeah. shoulder to shoulder, yeah. shoving microphones in his face. Now, now, whatever he's done, he's done, but that's besides the point. Uh, I would like to know why these journalists are not arrested and fined because there was no social distancing whatsoever. Is there one law for them and one law for us? Well, I, I, that's a point I made myself earlier and which uh, I'm actually dumbfounded uh, that uh, it has no echo in the political class or the uh, media class, uh, and certainly not amongst the police. Uh, these journalists yeah. outside uh, Dominic Cummings' house are committing criminal offences by the score. They are loitering, they are causing an obstruction, uh, they are placing uh, his wife and child in a state of fear and alarm, Uh, they are uh, mobbing, Uh, they are breaking all social distancing regulations, and all for what? To get a picture of him, yeah, putting his bike yeah. in the back of the car, like the previous 50 times that they've done this. Yeah. Now, I mean, myself- I, 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 when I saw police were at his door, and some fools were dancing at the possibility they'd come to arrest him, they were actually at his door because of the situation outside his house had become unsafe. Yeah. And Therefore, why did the police not disperse the mob outside? You see, David, I've been there. I have been many times mobbed uh, by these reptiles 
frightening your children and making them cry for no good reason. They can call, no, no. They can call Cummings. Uh, they can uh, ask to interview him by Zoom, by Skype, like everyone else is being interviewed. What's the case for terrifying his small child? For what purpose? Yeah, I agree with you totally. I mean, it's like I'm a wagon driver. Uh, we do nights and travel from Morecambe to Birmingham, Monday to Friday. There's hundreds of wagon drivers turn up down there. There's social distancing, there's gloves, there's masks. Everybody behaves themselves. So we do our job and we help to protect the country. But them people that were outside that house were a total disgrace. Repulsive. They to... They're absolutely repulsive, David. And hypocrites, yeah. of course. Total hypocrites. Uh, they, uh, yeah. are, they are responsible for Boris Johnson being the Prime Minister in the first place. The very same yeah. journalists that are now ferociously trying to tear the guts out of one of his aides are the very people who put Boris Johnson in power. Yeah, yeah, true. Unbelievable. David, thanks for the right. call. Lovely to hear from you. A night of the road truck driver from Morecambe. David, don't be a stranger. Call us anytime. Let's get the latest news with Jamie Lowe. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Tune in every Tuesday to Loud and Clear for a regular segment called False Profits, a weekly look at Wall Street and corporate capitalism, where we talk about the big economic issues of the week from the point of view of working people, the poor, and the U.S. position in the global economy. Join us this Tuesday and every Tuesday with financial policy analyst Daniel Sankey right here on Radio Sputnik. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money-related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson began his press conference with a statement of support for his controversial chief advisor Dominic Cummings, who broke lockdown rules in March. Mr Cummings drove 260 miles to Durham with his family to be near relatives when he and his wife developed symptoms of COVID-19. Speaking at the Daily Downing Street press conference, the Prime Minister said that Mr Cummings had followed the instincts of every father and every parent and that he had acted responsibly, legally and with integrity. Labour has called for an urgent inquiry into the allegations, while government ministers have rallied around Cummings and defended his conduct. Matt Hancock and Michael Gove were among those to back Cummings for self-isolating at a property adjacent to other family members in case he and his wife needed help with childcare during the lockdown. On Saturday, Cummings told reporters outside his home that he would not be resigning and that he had done the right thing. But despite the support from the Prime Minister and Conservative front benches, several MPs from his own party have called for Dominic Cummings to quit. The influential Tory MP Steve Baker is among eight backbenchers to publicly question his position. There's only a 50% chance of the Oxford coronavirus vaccine working because cases in the UK are declining so fast. One of the scientists behind it has warned. The University of Oxford's Jenner Institute and the Oxford Vaccine Group began developing a COVID-19 vaccine in January using a virus taken from chimpanzees, which they hoped to market by September. But with the number of UK coronavirus cases dropping every day, there may not be enough people to test it on, according to the Institute's director, Professor Adrian Hill. He told a Sunday newspaper, it's a race against the virus disappearing and against time. 
We said earlier in the year that there was an 80% chance of developing an effective vaccine by September, he added, but at the moment there is a 50% chance that we will get no results at all. We are in the bizarre position of wanting COVID to stay at least for a little while. The trial of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on corruption charges has opened in Jerusalem today, just days after he began a new term in office. 70-year-old Netanyahu is the first standing leader to face trial in the country's history. He denies accusations of bribery, fraud and breach of trust. As he arrived at the courthouse for a brief hearing, he said the cases were aimed at toppling him in any way possible. He was sworn back into office as head of a rare unity government a week ago. His political rival Benny Gantz agreed to share power following three inconclusive elections in under a year. He has rejected calls by opponents to step down while he fights the case. Police have fired tear gas at protesters in Hong Kong after hundreds of demonstrators clashed with security officials in the Wan Chai district over Beijing's proposals to set up government intelligence bases in the territory. Protesters were seen cowering behind umbrellas as officers with shields fired the gas to try to disperse crowds of activists and journalists carrying free Hong Kong signs. China says it wants to prevent a repeat of last year's riots, which were triggered by a bill that would have allowed islanders to be extradited to the mainland. The government says the laws are necessary to prevent, stop and punish such protests in the future after the last demonstrations crippled the territory for months. Millions of Muslims around the world are marking the end of Ramadan with the Eid al-Fitr celebration. The festival of the breaking of the fast is one of Islam's two major holidays. It begins when the moon rises on the final day of Ramadan, a holy month of fasting. But with many countries still under coronavirus restrictions, Eid is looking very different for many people this year. As the start of the festival depends on the sighting of the new moon, the first day of Eid varies between countries. Somalia and Kenya began celebrating on Saturday. Indonesia and Thailand held Eid prayers today. But in some parts of the world, Muslims are still fasting and won't mark Eid until tomorrow. And finally, an alligator believed to have once belonged to Adolf Hitler has died in a Moscow zoo. The zoo said the reptile called Saturn was around 84 years old when he died on Friday. Saturn was born in Mississippi in the US and was later gifted to Berlin Zoo, from which he escaped when it was bombed in 1943. His whereabouts were unknown until 1946 when British soldiers found him and gave him to the Soviet Union. Almost immediately, the myth was born that he was allegedly in the collection of Hitler and not in the Berlin Zoo, Moscow Zoo said in a statement. Saturn apparently loved the brush massage and if something was not to his liking, he could gnaw apart steel feeding tongs and concrete decorations. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. listening to Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. A happy Eid, of course, to all our Muslim viewers and listeners, to all the faithful Muslims around the world. Uh, Dominic Cummings, should he be sacked? 62% say yes. Uh, should he resign? 12% say yes. Should he stay? 26% say that Dominic Cummings uh, should stay. Now, you get all kinds of false identification in life. Uh, you get all kinds of fake news. Uh, but there has been nothing so hurtful so painful and so false as what I am about to read out to you about me. Time Bandit on YouTube says, I saw George at Hamden Park a few years ago at a Take That concert. Time Bandit, I have never in my puff, been at a Take That concert. And I will never, ever be at a Take That concert. But what I can tell you is uh, that Robbie Williams is an avid viewer of my YouTube videos. I know that because he said so in a magazine interview. 
Robbie Williams spends many hours watching my YouTube videos. So should you take that. But it is Bob Dylan's birthday. He is 79 years young this day. And I have been, uh, since I was 13 years old, a fan of Bob Dylan, the likes of which most people cannot imagine. I have everything that Bob Dylan has ever made, and in triplicate, in vinyl, on cassette tapes, in uh, CD form, and now on download. And for many years, my favorite track, I was tangled up in blue off my favorite album, Blood on the Tracks, but I've got a new favorite now. And in the honor of Bob Dylan, after this show, I want you to listen to it. It won the Oscar. It's called Times Have Changed. I often feel Bob is singing, not about me, but for me. He certainly is on that one. Now, here's our second poll. Where will you staycation this year? A, the coast, B, the countryside, C, a city. Or you make your own suggestion on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. I do think, as I said earlier, that there's going to be a boon uh, for uh, holidays in Britain. And a perfectly fine holiday can be had in Britain. And with a bit of investment, which we need to make in any case, uh, particularly on our coastal resorts, uh, we could do really well. Last summer, I spent a day at Brighton, a glorious day, admittedly, and I thought, why would anyone need to go to Benidorm when they could come to Brighton? Uh, but then I thought, actually, there are 50 other Brightons, potential Brightons, that with a bit of investment, we could have uh, at our uh, disposal. So, where will you staycation? A, the coast. B, the countryside. C, a city. Now, Dr. Ranjit is the Moats medic, and he's been with us right from the beginning of this crisis. And I think it's fair to say he has on this show spoken more sense medical and political and economic uh, than any other doctor in the land. It helps that he's fabulously handsome, even though he's had a lockdown haircut. Let's see how it's grown in this week. Dr. Ranjit, welcome back uh, to the mother of all talk shows. Let me begin with a point that was raised earlier. I'm springing it on you. You may not have had a chance to think about it, still less research it. Is there a possibility that, as a caller pointed out, uh, the countries which have uh, administered the most BCG jabs could really be uh, benefiting from that in relation to the coronavirus? You got any knowledge on that? It's not something I've looked into, George. It would seem extremely improbable uh, that the Bacille Kamet Gurin vaccine, very old vaccine against the bacteria, uh, that is tuberculosis. And of course, tuberculosis, tuberculosis is still extremely uh, widespread. Perhaps as many as one billion people have been exposed to uh, the TB, mostly dormant, uh, but it has a tendency to reactivate. And it's a still a very serious health problem, which on a world scale probably dwarfs the coronavirus. Um, but I, I, I doubt very much whether exposure to that vaccine would give immunity and probably the numbers are sufficiently small on any study that might indicate it that that would be subject to question but i haven't looked into it i can look into it and and, and give report you my back on uh, report uh, back next week sorry to spring that on you now uh, where where are we standing because the same caller uh, pointed out that the most deadly place in the entire world to be is little belgium uh, but the second most deadly place to be is britain that's a damning, damning inv indictment, isn't it? It is, and they're, they're talking about, of course, the number of cases per head of the population, number of, uh, of deaths per million. And that, that, that is around the 800 mark in Belgium. 
it's around the 650 mark in Britain. And it's actually lower in the United States. And in China, of course, it's less than two. So extremely low in China. Um, and yes, I think those are reasonable statistics to look at. And they're particularly useful to look at for, I mean, there've been different approaches to lockdown in different countries. Uh, and I see a lot of noise, if you like, particularly on the internet, that countries that didn't have a lockdown have done, have fared better in terms of their deaths per pro, pro rata uh, in head of the population. And it's not true, because if you look at Sweden, actually they've done just about as badly as we have, although their attitude to lockdown has been slightly different. Arguably, and you've argued it, you know, we've not really had a lockdown here. I mean, the really effective measures that countries have taken, and, and, and it's almost boring to keep on saying it, and the only reason you have to keep on saying it is because they're the measures that unfortunately most places have not been taken, which is very accurate testing and isolating people who have the virus from the population rather than simply putting that blanket, you know, sledgehammer maneuver, which is simply trying to stop everyone from moving. And that's, it's kind of a, it's a very primitive measure. It's a measure of last resort. And of course it has efficacy. People are talking all about the R number, the reproduction number, i.e. if I have the virus, how many people will I send that virus to? And that's partly dependent on the inherent properties of the virus. And we know that coronavirus, COVID-19, is extremely infectious, much more infectious than the flu. But of course, if you stop people from moving normally, then that means in that society at that time, while those restrictions are in place, doesn't have the opportunity to spread so that number goes down. And really that's, we're saying no more than that. And it's estimations that people are constantly giving based on the current number of infections that they're presenting. And of course, while the lockdown has been in place, the virus has lost less opportunity to spread and will spread to fewer people. But as we ease those restrictions and we haven't still got really good data on exactly who has the virus and where those people are, it is likely, unfortunately, to um, increase again. And as you say, our figures are, they're, they're extremely woefully poor. Now, the Sunday Times uh, today, I don't know if you had the chance or the taste uh, to do so, uh, have read it, uh, but I have read it. Uh, it is absolutely devastating in the case it makes uh, that for 22 days, uh, Boris Johnson and his Conservative government were so willfully negligent uh, that they, I say, not them, uh, that they, they, have a, they have criminal responsibility uh, in tens of thousands of lost lives. Well, I think that's true. Of course, a criminal responsibility is a matter for law. And as these people are the government, the question arises, who are the people who could ever hold them accountable? The, the concept is that the electorate hold them accountable by not electing them. But currently, with very little opposition, um, you wonder even if that will happen. Yeah. Although but there are court cases now uh, of families of people who were sent out of hospital without a test, but having symptoms into care homes, uh, where they not only died themselves, but killed, uh, I'm sorry to put it that way, killed other people in the care home. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, the government has a way of uh, giving compensation when they're forced to without admitting culpability or facing themselves the consequences of their actions. And it'll only be the British people who are able to hold them accountable in the final analysis. But they are accountable. And it's quite clear, you know, you, you talked a little bit on the show earlier about Dominic Cummings and, the, and, and his hypocrisy, if you like, in flouting his own uh, regulations. There's no doubt that um, he has been hypocritical and he has flouted his own regulations. But, but it is a, a distraction, the mother of all distractions, if you like, from the really, the real essence of the matter is what were the government provisions? What was the underlying ethos? And it was quite clear what needed to be done in terms of the public health measures. Those lessons were available uh, from China, from Korea, from Vietnam, from other countries. Um, what our government did was not guided by medical science. And the scientists are increasingly making it clear that it was contrary to their advice. It was guided by the economics and particularly the laissez-faire economics and to an extent, the philosophy, the Malthusian philosophy uh, by which uh, they felt it was not worth the economic cost to intervene to save the lives of people from whom they made no money. And that is the bottom line. And there is now more and more 
ways in which so that fundamental narrative can be verified, both from people who, you know, expose the words of Dominic Cummings at the time, uh, that we should protect the economy, that we should uh, allow it to run through the community and uh, look for herd immunity. Uh, and if few pensioners died, so be it. To Boris Johnson saying we just got to take it on the chin. And now increasingly to the scientists saying that, that there was inactivity despite their advice. That is quite clear that we'd be looking at many, many, probably perhaps hundreds of thousands of deaths. And of course, we may still be looking at that scenario, because if you do look at the figures based upon excess mortality, and this is only the first spike, and we don't know yet what the second spike is, but it's clear that there are more people, sadly, who have died of the virus this Sunday than last Sunday with the easing of the restrictions. So not absolutely clear that we are looking at the dying away, the fading away of this problem. And it's clear that from excess mortality already, there are probably around 60,000 or more people have died in Britain across all environments. And this may just be, I really hope it's not. Uh, in no way do I want to be vindicated. You know, I, I want us to get past this, but it may be that this is still the beginning, George. Yes, and uh, the uh, Kansas flu, misnamed the Spanish flu, uh, was its second spike was vastly greater uh, than the mortality in its first spike. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, that, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, th that's the case. Of course, we have to look at the way the pathogen interacts with the environment. And coming on the heels of the First World War, again, as we've said before, we had a population who had been ravaged by war, were malnourished. But actually, we have been living now through probably a decade of severe economic austerity, not only in the imperialist country, in the first world countries, in the richest countries on earth. But, you know, what was the response uh, with, to the banking crisis of 2008? There was suddenly the money that couldn't be productively or, or profitably invested into other avenues, poured into all kinds of avenues, commodities, housing, gold, but also food, basic foodstuffs became almost, you know, uh, uh, incomprehensibly expensive to massive people. So they're, they're a decade, for a decade, people throughout the majority of the world, the third world, have been getting poorer and poorer and having harder and harder conditions of life. And in a way, that situation can be compared uh, to that situation first world, after the First World War, where people through their poverty, through their malnutrition, um, will be at far greater risk immunologically than they would otherwise have been. So where uh, do you think we are? I know it's, uh, it's difficult to, to say. How many of us have actually really had it? Uh, the numbers I see are that uh, perhaps 20% of the people in London uh, have had this. I don't know if I've had it uh, because I can't get a test. Uh, my oldest son uh, had to go to hospital briefly for a few hours uh, this week uh, for another problem, which is mercifully fine now. Uh, but uh, when his mother asked, uh, well, now that we're here, and it just might be the coronavirus, can we get a test? And they said no. So who does get a test? I can't get a test. My son who's hospitalized can't get a test. Who's getting these tests, doctor? It's a good question. I think so now probably most hospital patients who are undergoing surgery or have a strong suspicion of having the symptoms can get access to testing. Uh, more and more of the healthcare professionals are having access to testing, to testing if they're uh, uh, showing symptoms. There are increasing numbers of trials of the antibody tests. Uh, and I think the antibody test is going to be um, the most useful test now because so many people will have had it, got over it, that the currently infected test, you know, the, 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 um, the DNA test, the uh, reverse transcriptase DNA test is not going to be the most useful one. It's going to be the serological evidence that people have been exposed to the infection that's going to be most useful. The more I look at it, not only in this country, but in other countries that have had or considered to be over the virus, it seems to me it's about 10% of the population of the countries that have been worst hit have had the virus. And that basically means that 90% of the population are still uh, vulnerable. Um, so, of course, as we know, the virus hits people in different people in different ways. The young, the middle-aged are relatively
What a pity, my goodness. I thought he was pausing to make a powerful point, as he always does, but we've, we've, uh, we've lost him. Uh, where will you staycation this year? The coast, 42%. The countryside, 50%. A city, 8%. Well, you can vote uh, between now and 10 o'clock uh, on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. And uh, James says, our holiday in the east coast of Ingerland, I hope. I love Whitley Bay. Uh, yeah, Whitley Bay is lovely, actually. Uh, Jordan says, Durham for me. I've heard it's the place to be. How wonderful. Woody says, somewhere pretty empty, probably with family. Plenty of places in hitting distance from Bury, gateway to the north. And Matthew says, I'll stay home, save money, buy myself something nice instead. And local vet says, the countryside, I'm liking this social distancing. Keep up the great work, GG. Thank you, Doc. And on YouTube, uh, we have this mystery uh, claim uh, that I was a few years ago at Hamden Park at a Take That concert. As if. And Emma says, I'm a new viewer. How have I lived my life so blind? This show should be compulsory viewing. Time to educate myself in lockdown. Thank you, George. Thank you, Emma. Lovely. Uh, Jane says, Cummings' crimes are minor compared to many of his colleagues, uh, but this is still serious and undermines every advice we have been given. And Twitter user says, Driving 200 miles, 250 miles in a car for whatever reason is safer than what's happening outside Cummings' home. If anyone is acting irresponsibly, it's the media. Can we sack them? Uh, the good news is most of them are on their way to being sacked anyway. And Aaron says, I'd be like Jesse Owens to the barbers when they open. I'm currently worse than Tom Hanks in Castaway. And uh, Joe, uh, I've done that one. Uh, James says, how is it that I can't sit in my back garden with my wife and two daughters, even if all of us are wearing masks and two meters apart, but I can book us all on a plane sit shoulder to shoulder with family and strangers with our masks on and this is okay providing we pass a temperature test and don't cough while we are in the airport well of course uh, from uh, june the uh, 8th i think it is uh, if you do leave the country as i would very much like to do uh, you will have to go into two-week quarantine uh, when you come back and uh, that would mean I couldn't present the mother of all talk shows, so I can't go overseas, even though I have a couple of quite important engagements. Uh, and David says the dangers of this virus is the danger of this virus is one thing. The politicalization of the virus is far more dangerous and virulent. Common sense has gone out of the window. Snowflake politicians are intent on self-destruction, even if they feel protected from any damage for any source. Ranjit's laptop has gone flat. Oh, what a pity. We're trying to get him back. I hope we do before the end of the show. And Jim says, I agree, George. I feel he should resign or be sacked. But to expose his family to this unruly scum, scrum, Freudian slip, is totally out of order. It was wrong when Jeremy Corbyn, wrong when Jacob Rees-Mogg had it. It's wrong and unjustifiable in my humble view. And John says, I want Cummings to stay put. The longer he stays, the worse it will get for Johnson and his government. Well, unfortunately, Boris Johnson has a majority of 80 seats in the British Parliament, and it is four and a half years until the next general election. Thanks, Sir Keir, and all your fifth column backstabbing traitors. I'll be right back. Radio Sputnik. Tune in every Tuesday to Loud and Clear for a regular segment called False Profits, a weekly look at Wall Street and corporate capitalism, where we talk about the big economic issues of the week from the point of view of working people, the poor, and the U.S. position in the global economy. Join us this Tuesday and every Tuesday with financial policy analyst Daniel Sankey right here on Radio Sputnik. 
Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. Sorry, unable to continue with Dr. Ranjit, but he'll be back next week as normal, I very much hope. Tess is on the line, though, from Pembrokeshire. Let's hear from her. Tess, welcome. Hi, George. Hi, anyway. Um, yeah, good, thanks. I've, I've noticed today, um, I've wondered if I've been missing something. I know our lockdown has been a bit rubbish, but I live under a flight path, and I've been able to see sky for the, the last few weeks because there's been hardly any planes. But today, like, there's hundreds of them. They're, they're back. They're, they're back like they always were. I just wonder, did I miss something? Well, I, I, I don't know uh, the stats, uh, but I live under a flight path too, uh, and uh, it's not, uh, it's the flight path into Heathrow, and it hasn't got uh, any quieter at any point uh, in the last 10 weeks uh, for mm -hmm. me, uh, but there will be a rush of people coming into Britain now, because for some bizarre reason, uh, they announced that you're going to have to quarantine when you arrive in Britain. Uh, but not until June the 8th, which is, which is an open invitation to as many people as possible to get to Britain as quickly as possible. Uh, I, I simply don't understand the medical scientific uh, rationale of that, Tess. Well, no, neither. that's such a good point. I didn't even think of that, but that's it, isn't it? That's nail on the head. Everyone yeah, I mean, it's like uh, the lockdown that. itself, if you recall. Uh, Boris Johnson announced that the boozers would be closed uh, from Monday. Yeah. Meaning that yeah. Friday and Saturday uh, were, uh, you know, New Year's Eve and Burns Night uh, rolled into one. Well, it's like the other day when they opened the takeaways again and, and everyone flocked there and they opened the beaches and everyone's yeah. at the beach or slagging each other off for being at the beach. <laughs> I must say that's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Uh, people, yeah, yeah. people who yeah. are at the beach, and mob-handed, by the way, criticizing <laughs> the other people that are mob-handed at the beach. I know. <laughs> That's the British. That's the British. Um, Tess, it's, a, it's a bad line, a bad line, but a good call. Thanks for it. Sean in Stevenage uh, on Cummings. Go ahead, Sean. Hey, up, George. Yes, sir. You did you do go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Did you make it to take that, mate? Uh, I, you know, no comment. But I've never been at a take that concert. I'm, it's I'm, it's fake news. I'm sure of that, but, George. I'm no, sure. It's of absolutely that, fake news, but I, it, it makes a point that you can't actually take somebody's word for saying they saw you somewhere. If you get my drift, <laughs> go I'd on. I'd be embarrassed. I'd be embarrassed to take that concert at all. Cummins, sack him. The only good Tory is one that's on the dole. He's a member of the most inept, incapable, ignorant bunch of government... I, 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 I mustn't say the word. No, but what will be, what will be achieved, policy. Sean? What will be achieved by him going? He'd be the first domino to fall but of a government that but, shouldn't be there. But, but they are there. Get rid of them. But they are there, and they're going to be there, uh, whether you like it or I like it, uh, for another four and a half years. Uh, they've got Indeed. a landslide majority. So, he did. He so, did. so taking uh, Cummings out of his job uh, is not going to make uh, the blind bit of difference. No, but it, it does show up the hypocrisy and the difference in treatment with a lockdown, a so-called lockdown, which hasn't really been much of a lockdown. No, quite. Because and Labour, and, and, and Labour you, you're slagging the Tories. Labour are pushing the Tories 
to get all our children back to school, even though Eton isn't going back till September. No, I realise that. I realise that. Um, what I was going to point out, in the lock, even in this lockdown, is on the quiet, you've still had large construction industry projects, for example, going exactly. on. As if and there was no changed. reason for that. There was no reason for that. All the builders were on the tubes and on the buses in the morning where the staff had no PPE, the, the, the travellers had no PPE, and were going to work on building sites, literally cheek by jowl, uh, to build a building that could have been built in August well, or September. I, I can tell you now there's a certain power station project down on the south coast that has four and a half odd thousand workers in it. And until just about halfway through May, they didn't have any social distancing measures on that site. People were very concerned. They belatedly introduced it and cut, cut the numbers so that those that could work from home did. So there's only a couple of thousand down on the site. But they're still working. And there are still people bossing in. And it turns out the Unite Union sent around a message saying there was at least five workers tested positive for the COVID disease. So... Unbelievable. Is it's not, there, hasn't uh, no, there hasn't no, been no, a lockdown. There hasn't been a lockdown. It's undeserving of the name lockdown. And it started too late. And it's ending too early. How's that for a, for a hat trick? <laughs> and then Sack Cummins and you'll have made my day. Well, not you personally, but yeah, they can. Yeah. Surely because he's a trust hypocrite me, of the highest order. Tr tr setting the policy and, and then ignoring it himself. Wouldn't make a blind bit of difference, but thanks for a great call, Sean. Uh, Ryan yes. is in California. Go ahead, Ryan. Hello, George. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. And you. And recently the, uh, recently the transcripts with the secret uh, classified hearings um, with the president of CrowdStrike who was the head, um, the head of the investigation into John Podesta's leaked emails, yeah. which were um, supposedly or, you know, um, suspected to be hacked by Russian um, operatives. And as we see in the transcripts, the president of um, CrowdStrike, to paraphrase, he said, we had uh, evidence that data was prepared to be exfiltrated, but we have no clear evidence that it was exfiltrated. So as you can see, it's very clear, like tricky language within that. And I have two separate branch or a, a few different questions regarding this. One being, what is your thoughts as far as, you know, the whole democratic narrative, pushing this whole Russia gate, um, conspiracy theory, pro dividing the country drastically, and what, what role did the intelligence communities have in that? And then lastly, how should, I'm from the Bay Area where we have so-called Democrats and so-called progressives like Nancy Pelosi and Ro Khanna, who are all pushing this narrative. And unfortunately, most of the people still um, hold that Russia had some sort of influence within the election, mm -hmm. whether it was false advertising or whatever have you, whatever different narratives yeah. they came up with. Yeah. But the main one I feel like was this John Podesta email. And most people don't realize that. So how would you recommend holding these people like Ro Khanna and other so-called progressives that push this basically intelligence conspiracy theory, holding them accountable? Great call, uh, Ryan. I must say, uh, from the Bay Area in California, thanks uh, very much for making it. Uh, I'm, I'm in a position to know uh, that the uh, Podesta emails, the uh, DNC material was not hacked but leaked. I absolutely know that as clearly as I know that I'm sitting here in this studio right now. I know it. I can't tell you how I know it uh, or I'd have to kill you and I'd probably be killed as so many have been uh, that are connected to this uh, murkiest of affairs. Uh, but I know that the material was leaked and not hacked. And therefore, the uh, entire uh, Russiagate hair that was set running is completely bogus. And its purpose, if you think about it, is not hard to work out. If you lose a presidential election, despite spending $1 billion 
and your opponent is a big, stupid idiot, Paluka, the orange man, a TV reality star, and you lose. You have to have an excuse. You have to invent a reason other than your own failings. In the choice of your candidate, in the election tactics and strategy of your candidate, how you spent the money, which states you visited, and so on. And the Democrats have been in a state of denial about the truth, which is that the only person in America who could have lost to Donald Trump was Hillary Clinton. And she did. And I predicted that she would when everyone laughed at the very possibility of President Donald Trump. A new caller on line two, Alice in Wiltshire. Let's hear from her. Alice, welcome. Oh, hello. How wonderful to hear your voice. Go ahead. Okay, so um, mine and at least three million other people's issue is that the British government's support schemes, um, financial support schemes, um, to help us through COVID-19 lockdown and beyond, um, basically exclude um, in their... Oh, sugar. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Right. Um, they um, were excluded from any government support. And Are you talking about that section of the self-employed community uh, that um, doesn't there's, qualify? There's, yeah, there's, there's self-employed, there's people like myself who've had a small business for 27 years. And I, well, if I furloughed myself, I'd get £210 a month because I, all, I, I draw the state pension. Because we pay ourselves by dividends and they say that they can't identify those against people that have a portfolio of investments and get dividends. What about the bounce taken... back loan, Alice? Have you tried for that? Yeah, no, I've taken a large one of those so that I can pay off um, a lease purchase on the laser that I use in my beauty business um, that I bought a year ago and I've still got three years to pay so that I don't have any payments to pay out on that over the next year. Oh, that's right. So There's that no, no I, repayment so for a year and then yeah. I think 3%. Uh, over the next uh, two, three years? 2.5%. Yeah, yeah. That's not a bad um, deal, actually. So, no, it's not. Um, but in the meantime, I've had no income personally or for my business to cover other expenses that I have to pay for the last 12 weeks. Wow. Um, and there's going to be at least another month of it. Um, I've had to use the money I'd set aside for paying VAT bill and corporation tax in order to survive. Um, and there's, there's the new starters that um, fell outside of it. There's, there's so many of us. Yeah, millions. Um, and, and, have you, have and, you raised this with your undoubtedly conservative member of parliament? I have indeed, um, and initially, when I first realised that I'd qualified for nothing uh, except £210 a month to replace two and a, two, well, nearly 3 k a month I pay myself um, through my hard work of working 50 hours a week. Sure. Um, and um, initially, so basically, he just said, well, you know, there's this and there's that, and it's unprecedented in what we're doing. But, you know, if you're going to support some, you should support all. Yeah. You know, otherwise well, uh, the economy, the you only, know, the economy the, is going to go even worse. Yeah, of course. The only thing you I want... can uh, advise uh, is that you tell your member of parliament uh, that uh, his or her failure to support you uh, in your time of need has ensured that you will not be supporting him or her in their oh, time of need like, at the next general election. Two weeks ago, and I've had no response to that one. As I say, I had a response to my first two or three. Mm. Um, I'm very, very sorry uh, for your troubles, Alice. I wish I could solve them, uh, but I can't, alas. 
Uh, but thanks for telling us about them. And there are indeed millions of people uh, in the same boat as you. Joshua is in London. Let's hear from him. Always worthwhile. Go ahead, Josh. You right there, George? Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was going to say about the uh, the way in which COVID-19 pandemic has been a, a propaganda gift. Uh, I wouldn't say God sends because I don't think God would want this to happen, of course, but uh, a propaganda gift to the alt-right because pe- sinophobia, okay, is, is absolutely rife as a result of COVID-19. I am so worried that it is going to generate the ultimate uh, propaganda mechanism against the Chinese, possibly the most successful, uh, which I, I am fearful of because, of course, China is entitled to become uh, the, the world's leading economic power, given its population. And I'm, I'm very worried that this is going to stifle Chinese development when they most need it. With their I, don't think it will, of- uh, I don't think it will, Joshua. Thanks for the call and the point. Uh, first of all, China has, by definition, uh, the biggest internal market in the world as the uh, biggest population. Uh, in the world. And there's a lot of unmet need still uh, in the Chinese internal market. And I wish, actually, that they would pay more attention to it uh, to ensure uh, more equality and equal development across all regions and amongst all people uh, in uh, China. Uh, And secondly, a very large proportion of the world is increasingly out with uh, the empire. Uh, And today, hallelujah, we saw a taste of that uh, when, despite all the threats and bluster of the empire, uh, the oil tankers uh, sent by Iran to besieged Venezuela have broken through that siege and landed to great rejoicing uh, in uh, the uh, Venezuelan ports. Uh, And this will accelerate, you know, Viruses are an agent of change. Many things change uh, when there is a big epidemic, pandemic uh, such as this. And one of the things that will change as a result of this period is that the empire itself uh, will lose a very considerable ground. Thank you, Joshua, in London. Let's hear from Brian in Glasgow. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, George. Hi there. Uh, George, I was just wanting to ask you, how do you think society, as we go through this lockdown and in particular, uh, the way everything's had to halt, I'm thinking that hopefully one thing coming out of it, society have a better understanding of how we can finance as opposed to how the elites and others have told us how we must finance. Quite so, absolutely. Uh, The notion that uh, a government with a sovereign currency uh, like ours Uh, needs to borrow money uh, for investment in our own people, our own economy, is bust wide open. Uh, It was uh, always fatuous, uh, but it's now bust wide open. Uh, If we'd remained in the euro, that would have been, uh, if we'd ever joined the euro, if we'd remained in the European Union, uh, subject to its fiscal rules, uh, that would have been a different matter. But we were sensible enough to leave the European Union. And so now we are a sovereign country with a sovereign currency. And we can do George, with it as we please. George, and do you think, because of the thing you just was about to point out, you've done already once again, you've pointed ahead, Europe and the way that euro is structured, do you not think that the euro is destined to die? Because every, it doesn't... every possibility. Every possibility that the euro will die. Every possibility that the EU will die. It'll have to come the Bundesbank, will it not? Yeah, but you've already got a, a confrontation between the yeah. uh, German Supreme Court and the uh, bank and the uh, executive, the commission, in mm-hmm. Brussels over the question of uh, these euro bonds, uh, which were supposed to be a way that the worst affected parts of the European Union could get through this crisis, could get back up on their feet. But the Germans are saying, oh, wait a minute. We're going to have to pay for this, and we're not prepared to uh, pay for this. And so you're beginning to see, not just in the periphery, uh, where countries like uh, 
like uh, Italy in particular, are saying, well, what about us? By the way, Italy is a very big and powerful country to call a peripheral country. And there are much smaller uh, countries on the periphery too. Uh, but the, the cash cow itself, Germany, uh, is saying, no, nah, enough, enough of this. So I actually foresee the European Union not outliving me. There's a prediction. Go ahead, Pete. Last word uh, to you, Brian. No, George, I totally agree with you, and I think that's what's going to happen. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that the, the society will be a bit more, less enamoured by the economists and start using the experience to understand that we will finance the projects that matter, and there's never not enough money for that. Exact, exactly. Brilliant. Brilliant, Brian. Thanks for that. Peter is in Sheffield. Let's hear from him. Peter, go ahead, sir. Hello, George. Good evening. Evening. First of all, I wanted to congratulate you for a very powerful exposition of the Palestinian cause that you aired earlier. Thank you. Uh, and I wanted to ask you a, a hypothetical on that subject. Yeah, go on. Um, imagine you were asked to advise, let's say, a future Labour government on the immediate uh, concrete measures that they would take in relation to Israel-Palestine on, mm. on becoming a government. Mm. What would your priorities be, do you think? Uh, well, the British government, whoever forms it, will have virtually no influence on the outcome uh, of events in Israel-Palestine. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, British government outside of the EU uh, will have a foreign policy much more uh, in line with that of the United States, which is by far and away the most important factor. The right. only two factors that matter in shaping the outcome of the Israel-Palestine conflict are the United States and the Arab world. The masses uh -huh. of the Arab world, 350 million of them, uh, from uh, Marrakesh to Bahrain, from the Atlantic to the Gulf. If things change in the Arab world, uh, then that will decisively uh, influence what happens in Palestine. If uh -huh. things change in the United States, uh, that will even more directly and rapidly influence uh, what happens uh, in Israel-Palestine. But I'm not expecting either of these two things to happen anytime soon. And absent either of those th two things, uh, no Labour government, uh, particularly one led by Keir Starmer, uh, will have uh, anything meaningful to say on it, Peter. Okay, I thank you for that. Welcome, thank you for the call. Uh, Marco says, uh, Cummings should be fined for breaking the lockdown rules and potentially putting others at risk. People in leadership need to understand that the more they break or bend the rules that they put in place, the more people will distrust authority. They must practice what they preach. And Roy says, kids are four times more likely to be struck by lightning than to be affected by COVID. You just make these numbers up, Roy. Stop being a bedwetter and get them back where they belong. Uh, maybe you need to see me personally and say that to my face, Roy. Uh, social comments in response to the poll. The handling of this situation will be the cause of a second wave. Expect beaches to be crammed tomorrow. What Johnson has done tonight in actually praising Dom will have finished the lockdown for many people. John is in Glasgow on the SNP and COVID, a subject I've been uh, concentrating on a bit this week myself. John, welcome back. Welcome back. Well, thank you very much, George. Glad to hear you've been concentrating on it. You were reading um, uh, the charge sheet, Boris, Boris's COVID charge sheet earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been uh, firing on all cylinders against <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon and well, the just... Nike cover-up well, and the care you. home crisis, which is even worse than the English one. Absolutely. If you were to read her charge culpability charge sheet, um, the judge would have done for lunch. Um, I mean, the comparison being made here between Belgium and the United Kingdom would be probably better to be Belgium and Scotland. Um, because really, um, if ever there's really a, a damning indictment of legislative devolution at Holyrood, the handling by the administration there of the COVID situation uh, is it. And um, they have failed comprehensively behind the curve, before the curve, you name it. And one of the worst examples 
is this whole nonsense of this hospital, this built brand new hospital, lying empty in Edinburgh, and in the meantime, they spend money on this exhibition centre on the Clyde, um, putting partition walls in, stick a bed and a feel good uh, bedside cabinet in. Why hadn't they spent the money to finish the hospital in Edinburgh? Quite so. Uh, their, uh, their, uh, their stewardship of the National Health Service and the Education Service and the Police Service in Scotland is so bad that it's amazing to me that they still managed to get at least 40% of the Scottish people wanting to give them state power and independence. Well, I think those days are over, George, now, because this is revealed, the, the, the Emperor's the emperor has been revealed as having no clothes now with all of this, um, and uh, when it comes next year, um, the, the, the verdict will be cast, and I don't think it will be a favourable one, because it is, it, it is really, really bad. Uh, I mean, we, I think in Scotland we have actually been worse served. The devolution was supposed to, our devolved legislative power was supposed to mean that we were better off. Um, the whole Nike Hilton thing you mentioned, she had every opportunity because she claims to have devolved power to have taken some action ahead of Boris Johnson, if she had so desired. Um, uh, but she, no. she took no action and covered it up. It would appear so. Well, so, uh, otherwise the, the game at Murrayfield wouldn't have gone on. Uh, the boozers uh, in the very street uh, of the Hilton would not have been mobbed by people if they had told people uh, that there was a mass outbreak uh, in that hotel at a Nike event, uh, then the game would have been off and nobody would have been there. Well, I think there's a suspicion amongst uh, very many people. I mean, Boris Johnson has not been a great deal of lifting or easing, but I mean, there's wide open spaces in Scotland. Uh, there's nothing stopping people playing a round of golf uh, with social distancing. But I think there's a suspicion now that the reason we are still on complete and full lockdown down now two weeks after the easing in England and still with another week to go is that the Scottish administration can't chew gum and walk at the same time. Absolutely. Well, look, thanks, uh, John. The hour is against us, and I want to squeeze in a last call. It's from Joan in Bournemouth, because she's got a contrary point of view. Let's hear from her. Go ahead, Joan. I'm very, very concerned with the eagerness of our Prime Minister to be big friends with Bill Gates regarding the vaccination. Bill Gates has already lost his popularity in America regarding vaccination on children. He's made billions of pounds. Is he using our national health service? When you say he's made billions, uh, John, I never, quite, I never quite understand this. Uh, Gates has given away most of his money. He's no longer interested in making money. And he doesn't make vaccines. No, but he funds research for vaccines. Well, he makes donations uh, yeah. towards the research on vaccines. Don't get me wrong. I'd, I'd uh, turn them upside down and shake every last penny out of his pocket and confiscate it. So I'm not here arguing for him. I'm just wondering why he is uh, this devil amongst all the oligarchs, all the plutocrats, all the 1%. I'm just wondering why it's him that gave away almost all of his money is the guy that keeps getting it in the neck. Your last word. He's making a fortune. He's not making a fortune. He's giving his money away. Yes, that he's made on. He's made this money. He's not trying to make money. He might be the Can devil he? himself. He might be pushing vaccines that are dangerous. That I'm prepared to accept. But he's not doing it to make money. He already gave away almost all of his money. Joan, be careful personifying individuals like Cummings, like Gates, like Soros, like Rothschild, and setting off in hot pursuit of individuals. It's our system economic and political uh, that is wrong not any one individual so unfortunately John we're out of time if I had more time I would have let you back in I promise you can call me back next week 
and hold me to that. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you.